Thank you for joining us and welcome to this virtual board meeting of the National Transportation Safety Board. I'm Robert Sumwalt. I'm honored to serve as chairman of the NTSB. And joining us today are my colleagues on the board, Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg, member Jennifer Homedy, member Michael Graham, and member Tom Chapman. Today we meet in open session as required by the Government and the Sunshine Act to consider the Atmos Energy Corporation natural gas fueled explosion in Dallas, Texas on February the 23rd, 2018. Tragically, the explosion killed one person and injured four others. On behalf of all of us at the NTSB, I offer our sincerest condolences to the family that lost their beloved 12-year-old daughter in the explosion, and we wish those who were injured in the explosion a full recovery. And please understand that the reason that we are here today is to learn from this tragic accident and issue safety recommendations to prevent these things from happening again. Next month will mark the three-year anniversary since this accident occurred. Now, NTSB accident investigations are often complex and it can take considerable time to do a thorough job. And meetings like today's board meeting are an opportunity, first and foremost, to discuss what happened in the accident. However, I do want to invite investigators to remind us of any complications or challenges that contributed to the length of the investigation as appropriate. In response to the explosion that we'll discuss today, Atmos crews that were already in the area and Dallas Fire Rescue personnel initially evacuated a two block area. This evacuation area was expanded three times, eventually including 300 single family homes, 250 apartments and an elementary school. Today, we will also discuss the actions that were taken by Atmos and Dallas Fire Rescue in response to the two separate gas incidents and in other houses on the same block. Each of these events resulted in an injury and extensive property damage. Of significance, one of those events happened two days before the February 23rd explosion and the other happened the day before the explosion. We'll look at leak investigation and repairs. And we know that it will also examine the actions that Atmos took in response to the knowledge that it gathered. We'll talk about methane detection. None of the residents in the affected homes reported smelling gas and odorant, the additive to natural gas that smells, that can be depleted if it travels through soil. We'll discuss the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, or PHMSA's, reporting requirements. And because of the non-fatal incidents that were not reportable incidents by PHMSA's definition, state and federal regulators were not notified of them in time to oversee Atmos's response before the February 23rd explosion. And we'll consider Atmos's integrity management program. Was it consistent? with regulatory requirements and industry practice, and did it adequately address the system's risk. Each board member has studied the draft report and each of us has met individually with the investigative staff. And today's board meeting, however, is the first time that we as a deliberative body will have gathered to discuss the report. Today, staff will lay out the pertinent facts and analysis found in the draft report, and then they will present the draft findings, a probable cause and recommendations to the board. Then we on the board will question the staff to ensure that the report that as we adopt today truly provides the best opportunity to enhance safety. The public docket for this report contains more than 3,900 pages of additional relevant material, and it's available on our website at www.ntsb.gov. The report will also be available on our website in just a few weeks once any amendments voted upon today are incorporated and the report is finalized for release. At this time, I'd like for each of my colleagues on the board to introduce themselves. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and uh, I look forward to our deliberations. It's good to see you. Thank you. 
Member Homedy. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to my colleagues and staff. And I look forward to the presentations and uh, the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much. Member Graham. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, fellow board members, uh, investigative staff and staff. Uh, I look forward to our deliberations today. And Member Chapman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and colleagues, and thanks to the staff for the hard work on this investigation. I agree. It's been a lot of work for our staff. At this time, I'll ask Managing Director Sharon Bryson to introduce the investigative and support staff who will be participating in today's board meeting. Good morning, Ms. Bryson. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Sumwalt. I'd like to also thank everyone who helped make the virtual board meeting uh, happen today. It's been a team effort as many things are at the agency. There have been multiple staff members representing a wide range of offices that have contributed to making this uh, board meeting occur. My only administrative announcement this morning is just a reminder for those who are presenting uh, to silence all of their electronic devices at this time. Now I'd like to introduce staff for today's meeting. Mr. Robert Hall, who is the director of our Office of uh, Railroad Pipeline and Hazardous Material Investigations. Mr. Mike Hiller, who is the deputy director for the Office of Railroad Pipeline and Hazardous Material Investigations. Sean Lynham, who's the chief of the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Division. Sarah Lyons, who's the investigator in charge for this accident. Rachel Gunaratnam, who is handling emergency response. Dr. Stephen Jenner, who's handling human performance. Mr. Frank Zakar from our Office of Research and Engineering, who is handling the materials work. Nancy McAtee, who is our fire and explosion specialist. Ms. Darlene Hatchett, who's the director of the Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. Ms. Kathy Silba, who is our general counsel. Mr. Jim Ritter, who's the director of our Office of Research and Engineering. Mr. Scott Rainey, um, our safety recommendation specialist, Mr. Michael Huff and Alex Coletti, who are handling the visuals for us today, and Ms. Gina Evans, who is the report writer editor on this product. The presentations today will begin with an investigation overview by our investigator in charge, Sarah Lyons. Sarah? Good morning, Chairman Sumwalt, Vice Chairman Landsberg, members Hammondy, Graham, and Chapman. I'm Sarah Lyons, investigator in charge of the investigation of a natural gas pipeline explosion that occurred in Dallas, Texas on February 23rd, 2018. This morning, staff will present on the investigation and I'll begin with an overview. At about 6.38 a.m., an explosion occurred at 3534 Española Drive causing significant structural damage to the home. The explosion killed a 12-year-old girl who had woken up early that morning and injured four other family members who were sleeping. One sustained a severe foot fracture and the other three sustained minor injuries. In the days prior to the explosion, two gas-related incidents occurred at homes on the same block that were served by the same natural gas main. The first incident occurred on February 21st at about 5.49 a.m. and the second on February 22nd at about 10.21 a.m. Each of these incidents resulted in second degree burns to one resident. All three homes were later demolished. None of the occupants reported smelling gas odorant prior to these events. This figure shows the relative locations of the three homes. There was a shared unpaved alley behind the homes, which contained a wrapped steel natural gas main shown in blue, as well as a polyvinyl chloride or PVC sanitary sewer main shown in beige. The natural gas main was original to the neighborhood, having been installed in 1946, about 71 years prior to the explosion. The original sanitary sewer main and laterals had been replaced in 1995 and constructed with a crushed stone and granular material embedment. The sanitary sewer laterals extended from the property line of the homes on the south side of this block 
above the natural gas main to the sanitary sewer main. On the days that the incidence and explosion occurred, the temperature ranged from 34 to 52 degrees Fahrenheit and significant rainfall was observed. Following the second incident, the Dallas Fire Rescue Department's incident commander asked Atmos's responding service technician to investigate what was going on. The service technician contacted his supervisor who sent additional Atmos employees to the site. The red and orange circles shown in this figure indicate the 13 grade one or two leaks found prior to the explosion. The leaks identified as grade one were determined by Atmos to present an existing or probable hazard, where the leaks identified as grade two were determined to present a probable future hazard. Atmos also identified one leak on a customer line, which is shown by a blue circle. Atmos had completed repairing all four grade one and two of the grade two leaks after the second incident and before the explosion occurred. Two additional leaks, which were found by NTSB investigators after the explosion are shown here for reference. One was on the service tap and the other one was on uh, the natural gas main. The leak on the natural gas main was located directly beneath a sewer lateral, which is the green pipe shown in this photograph. The clearance between the sewer lateral and the gas main was about half an inch. When the gas main was pressurized and soap tested, NTSB investigators heard an air release and saw soap bubbles on the main. This photograph also shows the sandy granular material embedment that surrounded the sewer lateral. The depth of the natural gas main at this location was about four feet. Natural gas can form an explosive mixture when combined with air in concentrations between the lower explosive limit or LEL of about 5% and the upper explosive limit or UEL of about 15%. Atmos took post-explosion gas measurements on the day of the explosion, detecting gas in the backyard and in the alley behind the home. NTSB investigators later confirmed the presence of gas along a path between the cracked main and the home, obtaining readings as high as 43% natural gas and air well above the lower explosive limit, 12 days after the system had been isolated. Although the natural gas was odorized, giving it the familiar sulfur smell that can provide a warning to residents, the odorant was depleted as it migrated through the soil to the house. Gas accumulated in the house and was ignited by an unknown source. Parties to this investigation include the pipeline, and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, the Railroad Commission of Texas, the Dallas Fire Rescue Department, and Amos Energy Corporation. After assessing the events of this explosion, staff identified safety issues related to incident investigation, leak investigations and repairs, methane detection, incident reporting, and integrity management. This concludes my presentation. Mr. Frank Zakar will now present on the materials laboratory's examinations. Good morning. My name is Frank Zakar. I am a senior metallurgist with the materials laboratory. In my presentation, I will discuss the examination of the gas main. The gas main was manufactured from American Petroleum Institute grade C seamless pipe. The gas main was protected against corrosion by an external coal tar enamel coating and cathodic protection by means of sacrificial anodes. Examination of the gas main revealed the top surface contained a dent and four major gouges. The photograph showed the location of the dent this main was located about half an inch below the sewer lateral that led to the dwelling at 3539 Durango Drive. The external coating was missing from the dent and gouge areas, and the dent and gouges were covered with calcareous deposit. 
A calcareous deposit is a layer comprised primarily of calcium carbonate. It is a byproduct of cathodic protection and forms on any exposed or damaged metal surface of the pipe. The dent was intersected by a circumferential crack that extended about halfway around the main. The size of the dent was about half an inch deep by 1.4 inch wide in diameter. The photograph at the top shows a side view of the gas main with the dent and crack that intersected this dent in the as received condition. The photograph at the bottom shows a top view of the gas main after the deposits were removed from the region containing the dent. Post cleaning procedure exposed several gouges and clearly shows a crack that intersected the dent. The dent and gouge damage was typical of third party damage resulting from digging operation from above ground when searching for a pipe. Such damage does not typically occur when laying pipe down into an open pit. The severity of the damage is consistent with those caused by excavation equipment and not from a shovel. Based on these observations, the dent and gouge damage most likely resulted when the sanitary sewer lateral was replaced in 1995. As indicated earlier, on-site pressure testing by Atmos revealed the gas main behind 3539 Durango Drive was leaking natural gas. The NTSB Materials Laboratory conducted pressure testing in this segment of the gas main to determine the leak rate using compressed air. This gas main was tested with compressed air instead of natural gas using an inline electronic flow meter. The leak rate was converted from volumetric leak rate in air to volumetric leak rate for natural gas. Atmos records showed that the operating pressure in the days before the accident was between 17 and 45 pounds per square inch. For this pressure range, laboratory testing showed that the corresponding gas leak rate was between 8 and 14 cubic feet per minute. NTSB also pressure tested a service tee located behind 3524 Española Drive, which shares the same gas main. Pressure testing showed that the service tee started to leak at 55 pounds per square inch, which corresponded to a low leak rate of about 0.2 cubic feet per minute. This photograph shows the fracture face after the crack was opened in the laboratory. The dent is located at the top of the main. The following described a sequence of events that led to the gas leak. Bench binocular microscope examination of the fracture face revealed the crack emanated from multiple origins at the bottom of the dent. Two black thumbnail-like cracks indicated by arrows S1 and S2 extended from the bottom of the dent to the areas indicated by dashed lines. The black thumbnail areas were rich in iron oxide. The two thumbnail cracks arrested for a period of time. Later, the crack propagated from the two thumbnail cracks and extended about halfway around the pipe circumference in the general direction indicated by the arrows driven by hydrogen induced cracking mechanism which embrittled the steel. Hydrogen induced cracking most likely was due to an electrochemical reaction resulting from cathodic protection and the environment. The crack terminated in the areas indicated by solid lines. The fracture face was covered with moderate corrosion and calcareous deposits. The presence of the corrosion and calcareous deposits indicated that the through wall crack was present for an extended period of time and that the through wall crack preceded all three fire explosion events, allowing natural gas to leak into the surrounding environment. This concludes my presentation. I will turn over the microphone to Nancy McAtee, who will discuss the fire and explosion evaluation.
Good morning. My name is Nancy McAtee. I'm a fire and explosion specialist with the Materials Laboratory. My presentation will cover the origin and cause for the incidents at 3527 and 3515 Durango Drive and how these incidents differed from typical structure fires. In the first incident, which took place on the morning of February 21st, 2018, the homeowner was at 3527 Durango Drive, heard a noise coming from the HVAC unit. He went to adjust the thermostat and noticed the heat was not working, so he entered the attic to investigate. He found the cover to the pilot light resting next to the unit and the pilot light was out. When he replaced the cover, the pilot light reignited and he was thrown back by an explosion. In the second incident, which took place on the morning of February 22nd, 2018, the homeowner at 3515 Durango Drive reported a fire at his residence. He stated that he was boiling water on the range top when he noticed the flames from the range turning red and growing out of control. When he went to adjust the burner, the burner flashed over him. Neither homeowner smelled gas prior to each incident. Post-incident testing revealed that the customer piping at both residences performed adequately and were excluded as source of gas inside each structure. The structure at 3527 Durango Drive, the location of the first incident, consisted of the original home and an addition, which included a bedroom and a restroom. Post-incident examination found extensive mechanical damage to the structure, including buckling, sagging, and displacement of the roof, as well as areas of displaced shingles and several holes, as shown on the photograph on the left side. Bulging and displacement of exterior walls and the separation of exterior siding from its anchors were also found. The photograph on the right shows the west exterior wall, which was displaced outward and detached from the roof, roof vent, and both windows. Fire-related damage was largely confined to the addition, areas adjacent to the addition, and the attic. The interior of the addition was destroyed by fire, as shown in the photograph of the restroom area on this slide. In the attic, wooden structures members located near the HVAC unit exhibited fire-related damage as shown in the photograph on the left. The ceiling of the living room located immediately below the HVAC unit had collapsed downward into the room but exhibited no exposure to fire. There were three gas appliances inside the residence. However, the HVAC unit was the only appliance to exhibit thermal damage as shown in the photograph on the right. The thermal damage to the HVAC unit indicated it was located within the accumulated gas. Staff determined the most of the damage to 3527 Durango Drive was not consistent with a typical house fire or firefighting and overhaul procedures. The damage was consistent with blast pressure wave damage. A blast pressure wave is not usually created during a typical structure fire and was consistent with a low order explosion, which is an explosive event where the blast pressure wave moves slowly, displacing or heaving rather than shattering objects in its path. The ignition of natural gas in air is a possible source of this type of explosion. The most likely source of gas was from outside the structure. The fire damage to the addition indicated that the fuel concentration was higher in this area making this the most likely entrance for gas to come into the house. The disruption of the soil underneath the structure during the construction of the addition created additional void spots within the soil. This would have allowed gas to migrate more easily into the addition as compared to the original home. Therefore, gas from outside 3527 Durango Drive likely entered the structure through the new addition before spreading up into the attic. Based on the homeowner's statement and the damage to the attic, the HVAC was the ignition source for the gas-air mixture inside the structure. I will now discuss the damage to 3515 Durango Drive, the location of the second incident. 
the structure sustained significant damage to both the exterior as well as the interior. The interior of the structure, including most of the interior walls and ceiling, were destroyed or heavily damaged by fire. The exterior of the structure sustained the most severe damage to the west and north sides. The photograph on the right shows the north side of the structure and the photograph on the left shows the west side of the structure around the carport. Located on a section of the west side exterior wall, there was an area of siding where the siding anchors were still attached to the exterior sheathing with no corresponding thermal damage. This is the only area of the structure that exhibited this type of damage. In addition, glass fragments were found embedded in the wooden slats of the fence located on the opposite side of the carport from the structure. While structure fires do generate some overpressure due to the generation of combustion gases from burning materials, those pressures are insufficient to project glass shards a significant distance. There was evidence that natural gas may have been present in this home immediately prior to the incident, including the homeowner's testimony, non-fire related damage to the home, and a statement from the neighbor that will be discussed in the next slide, indicating an issue she had with her natural gas range three days prior to the incident at 3515 Durango Drive. The photograph on this slide shows the gas range from 3515 Durango Drive. The thermal damage to the range was limited to the exterior of the appliance. Although the gas range could not be tested due to the incident related damage, investigators found no obvious signs of failure or malfunction during the visual examination. The gas range had been working well prior to the incident and no repairs had been done on the appliance. In a related incident, a nearby resident stated that she had contacted the gas company a few days prior to the fire at 3515 Durango Drive because of an issue with her gas range. She reported that when she turned the stove burner on, the burner flames were red instead of the normal blue. She stated that the gas company representative she spoke to told her there were no problems with the gas service in her neighborhood. Due to the similarity in flame color, this event is not insignificant, even though the exact cause of the unusual flame color went undetermined. Red, orange, or yellow flames from a gas range can be an indication of a fuel gas air mixture issue or the presence of contaminants. Based on the damage and the eyewitness account, the kitchen was determined to be the origin of the fire at 3515 Durango Drive. Due to the extent of damage to the structure and the kitchen range, the exact cause of the incident could not be determined. Since the structure sustained severe thermal damage, any signs of blast pressure damage would have been destroyed. The exclusion of other accidental causes was also limited due to the extensive damage. Natural gas was involved in both incidents on Durango Drive. There was insufficient evidence to exclude natural gas from Atmos's system from either incident, and there were leaks on Atmos's system present prior to these incidences. Further, it is very unlikely that multiple fires and or explosion events could occur on the same residential block in the same week independently. However, if a common cause such as weather conditions or gas leaks that feed multiple locations exists, the likelihood of additional events on the same block would be much higher. Therefore, the first two incidents and the explosion at 3534 Española Drive were all likely related. This concludes my presentation. Ms. Rachel Gudaratnam will now present on emergency response. Good morning. My name is Rachel Gunaratnam and I am the Emergency Response Group Chairman for this investigation. I will present on the safety issues involved with the investigation of the first two incidents, methane detection and incident reporting. The Dallas Fire Rescue Department and Atmos responded to all three homes on Durango and Espanola Drives. Firefighters were the first on scene and immediately took action to extinguish the fire one of their first actions was to also control the utilities by turning off the gas meter for all three homes. 
DFR Instant Commanders also requested both the electric and gas companies to respond in order to control any electrical and gas hazards that were present. The inc incident commanders also requested their arson investigators on scene. For all three incidents, NTSB staff found that the DFR firefighters responded in a timely and effective manner when extinguishing the fires, assisting in the rescue efforts of the injured, and with the evacuation of residents after the February 23rd incident. After responding to all three incidents, firefighters left the scene and relied on Atmos to monitor for gas after the fire was extinguished. At the time, the firefighters did not have access to their natural gas monitors, though normally this equipment is placed on their engines. The DFR, though, does have a hazardous materials response team, the HMRT, who have their own gas detection equipment and are trained to take a more aggressive role to managing a gas release. They were not called out for the first two incidents to monitor the structures to ensure that a flammable atmosphere was still not present after the fire was extinguished. When reviewing the DFR procedures, NTSB staff found that firefighters are required to monitor for gas when responding to a gas leak but not necessarily for a fire explosion that is gas related. When responding to a gas odor complaint or leak, the DFR procedure instructs firefighters to monitor for gas and if it's detected to then evacuate the structure, shut off the gas meter, ventilate the structure and continue monitoring for gas until the hazard no longer exists. However, this is not required when firefighters are responding to a gas related fire or explosion. While gas companies are more specialized in locating a gas leak, gas monitoring by the fire department would be an additional resource dedicated to finding the source of a gas leak. It is also an independent assessment to ensure that a flammable atmosphere does not still exist inside or near a structure after a fire or explosion. This ensures public safety, as well as the safety of the arson investigators who arrive on scene to investigate afterwards. Staff proposes a recommendation to address this safety issue. When on scene, arson investigators take photographs and interview witnesses. They then document their findings in a fire investigation report, which is intended to identify the cause and origin of the fire. The incidents from February 21st through 23rd were classified as undetermined because the cause of the fire could not be proven to an acceptable level of certainty. The reports also concluded both Durango home fires were related to a gas fueled appliance. NTSB staff reviewed the fire investigation reports and found that the information available could be helpful to identify the or origin and cause of a natural gas leak. However, if that information is not correct, it could be misleading when trying to identify the origin of the leak. For example, the initial fire investigation report for the February 21st incident identified a heater in the back room as the origin of the gas leak. However, no heater in the back room existed. They also communicated to the Atmos technician that gas likely came from inside the home. When NTSB opened an investigation, arson investigators followed up with the homeowners and found that it was the furnace of the HVAC unit in the front of the house that was the actual appliance involved. The conclusions made for both incidents at the homes on Durango Drive pointed to gas fueled appliances as the cause, indicating a problem with the house piping, which is not Atmos's jurisdiction and they drew these conclusions without having performed pressure tests on any of the natural gas piping, which would have verified whether the house piping was actually leaking. The arson investigators discovered key information on the circumstances of the February 21st and 22nd incidents that could have assisted the service technicians in their leak investigations. Had they been more aware of natural gas properties, its characteristics, and its operation in building fuel systems, they could have assisted the pipeline operator to identify earlier a leak in their distribution system. Staff proposes a recommendation to address the safety issue. Atmos's technicians respond, responded to both structure fires on Durango Drive and began investigating soon after the fire was extinguished. To determine whether gas was migrating underground, Atmos instructed its technicians to perform bar hole tests. To perform this test, a hole is made into the ground and the atmosphere around the hole is sampled for gas. 
For the first incident on 3527 Durango Drive, Atmos's technician performed only one bar hole test due to water saturated soil conditions. He did this near the meter without inserting his bar hole probe completely into the hole and detected no gas. He then surveyed for gas over the top of the soil and looked for bubbles, which can be indicative of a natural gas leak. He neither saw bubbles nor obtained any positive gas readings. The service technician spoke with a DFR arson investigator who told him that the fire was gas related and probably came from the inside the house. He then left the scene after 30 minutes. The Atmos service technician told NTSB investigators that due to safety concerns, he could not pressure test the customer piping to verify the arson investigator's statement. The pressure test would require him to reactivate the natural gas service, which would pose a risk of reigniting gas while firefighters were presently inside the house. However, he documented in his records that the gas leak originated from the cu customer piping, according to the DFR arson investigator. After the second incident, the DFR incident commander asked the responding Atmos technician to investigate what was going on. Atmos's investigation began at the incident property and then expanded, ultimately involving over a dozen personnel. The expanded response will be discussed later in the presentation. While investigating the incident at 3515 Durango Drive, the Atmos technician stated that the customer piping was not testable because of fire damage. The service technician conducted bar hole testing around the house and found no evidence of gas. However, he found the soil conditions to be wet and many bar holes had filled with water affecting the equipment's operation to detect gas. He told NTSB investigators that in such circumstances, he usually puts his measurement probe as close to the hole as possible without getting it wet to mitigate this issue. The service technician could not bar hole test near the meter because there was too much standing water puddled there. He observed bubbles in the water near the meter, but did not obtain any positive gas readings. As previously discussed by Ms. McAtee's presentation, the Atmos pipeline system could not be excluded as the cause of the gas leaks that occurred on February 21st and 22nd. Staff found that Atmos' investigation of the homes on Durango Drive was insufficient to determine whether their system could have caused the fires therefore posing a serious risk to the neighborhood. Staff proposes recommendations to address the safety issue. None of the residents at the three homes smelled gas, though odorant levels were tested and met federal requirements. Previous NTSB investigations found when odorized natural gas passes through the ground from a leaking supply pipe, the soil can absorb and deplete the odorant from the gas. In addition, significant rainfall can cause leaking gas to migrate laterally and into people's homes. The photo on the right is the backyard of 3527 Durango Drive, showing the significant rainfall that occurred back in February 2018. Had methane detectors been installed, an alarm would have alerted residents to a gas leak, prompting them to evacuate and call emergency response or the gas company. This would reduce the potential and consequence of a natural gas fire and explosion. NTSB staff proposes reiterating the open recommendations from the Silver Spring pipeline investigation that address methane detection and alarms. Timely incident reporting can make the difference between life and death when there is an active gas leak. A gas distribution incident must be immediately reported to the National Response Center if it involves a release of gas from a pipeline and meets certain consequence criteria, or if it is an event significant in the judgment of the operator. Atmos did not immediately report the first two incidents to the National Response Center because they claimed there was no evidence that these incidents involved a release of gas from their pipeline. More than eight hours after the second incident, Atmos sent a courtesy email to the Railroad Commission of Texas. NTSB staff found that the lack of official reporting delayed a timely response by the Railroad Commission, PHMSA, and the NTSB. Had they been alerted through proper channels, regulatory authorities could have encouraged or required Atmos to take a different approach when responding to the first two incidents to ensure public safety. 
PHMSA requirements rely on the judgment of the operator to determine if an event involves a release of gas from their pipeline or is otherwise a significant reportable event. The regulations do not specify the level of investigation required to make this determination. Industry guidance by the Gas Piping Technology Committee, or GPTC, lists items for operators to consider when evaluating whether an event is significant enough to report. These items include the following, an explosion, fire, loss of service, evacuation, involvement of per emergency personnel, or the media. Though many of these factors occurred, Atmos did not report the first two incidents to the National Response Center. They relied on its leak investigation data, implying that these incidents were not significant in the judgment of the operator. Staff proposes a recommendation to address the safety issue. Had the DFR arson investigators considered the first two gas incidents potentially related and a warning of a larger problem, they can raise fire or gas safety or code compliance issues to their supervisor, who can then advance it further to the relevant division within DFR or to a department within the city of Dallas. The DFR incident commander for the second incident on Durango Drive recognized the unusual circumstances of having two fires and explosions in close proximity of time and space. However, the department had no formal policy to report unusual circumstances and the two homes on Durango Drive were not elevated to be followed up on. Timely reporting prompts further investigation and oversight to prevent recurrence of an incident. Staff proposes a recommendation to address this safety issue. This concludes my presentation and Ms. Lyons will now present on operations and integrity management. This presentation will focus on operations following the investigation of the second incident, as well as integrity management. Atmos used both remote methane leak detectors, or RMLDs, and combustible gas indicators, or CGIs, to detect natural gas following the second incident. The RMLD was used to detect gas above ground. If gas was detected with the RMLD, a CGI was used to pinpoint the location of the gas leak. If a leak was suspected to be underground, a bar hole test was performed. Industry guidance, Atmos procedures, and vendor manuals all indicated that moisture negatively impacts the accuracy of these methods. The method that was available for use in wet weather conditions was a pressure test. The staff has proposed recommendations to strengthen the response to natural gas leaks, fires, explosions, and emergency calls to safely address the challenges presented by wet weather conditions. After investigating the locations where the two incidents occurred, Atmos technicians performed additional bar hole tests in the alley behind the affected homes. The location and results of the bar hole tests that were completed prior to the explosion are shown in this figure. The black circles indicate that a measurement was taken, but no gas was detected. The yellow, orange, and red circles indicate locations where gas was detected in various concentrations. No gas was detected near the two leaks that NTSB investigators later found during pressure testing. Atmos technicians told NTSB investigators that they found the bar hole testing difficult due to the muddy, wet soil conditions. Some of the bar holes filled with water and the technicians modified their technique to a process which was described as kind of bar holing, kind of surveying. This means that they were not always able to test the subsurface atmosphere for gas. One of Amos's survey specialists who was monitoring for gas above ground said that he found indications of gas all the way down this alley after the bar hole testing had been completed. He reported this observation to two operations supervisors. One of the supervisors told NTSB investigators that he interpreted this positive RMLD reading as a false positive and decided not to order additional bar hole testing. After the second incident on February 22nd, Atmos performed special leak surveys in the area surrounding the affected homes. 
Following the fatal explosion, Atmos performed additional leak surveys. Atmos found 13 grade one or two leaks prior to the explosion and 13 additional grade one or two leaks after the explosion, as shown by the red and orange circles in this figure. The leaks that were found following the explosion are indicated by a white dashed outline. Note that five of the leaks that were found, found after the explosion were within the boundaries of the pre-explosion special leak survey. Between February 23rd and March 1st, Atmos continued performing special leak surveys over an expanded area and worked with the Dallas Fire Rescue Department to evacuate additional areas in Northwest Dallas. On March 1st, Atmos announced that it would be conducting a planned outage, temporarily disconnecting natural gas service to about 2,800 homes in Northwest Dallas to replace the system. As Atmos's leak surveys expanded further, an unusually high number of leaks were detected in Northwest Dallas, including 741 grade one or two leaks within the area shown in this figure. These leaks were detected over a period of about five weeks following the explosion. Atmos reported that 73% of these Northwest Dallas leaks occurred on service lines and 86% involved coated steel pipe types. Of the 703 leaks that were excavated to determine the cause, Atmos reported that the predominant cause was strip threads, followed by gasket or O-ring failures, and then corrosion. These failure causes are typically associated with threats that can be predicted, including threats that degrade a system over time. However, Atmos's statistical risk evaluation did not identify the segment in the alley behind the three homes as relative high risk, nor did it identify the 2,800 home planned outage area as having an atypical number of relative high risk segments. There was no evidence of other buried infrastructure failing at unusually high rates in this area at this time. Following the explosion, Atmos indicated that the large number of leaks near the explosion site was abnormal, sudden, and unexplained. Atmos hired a consulting company that completed a preliminary assessment report five days after the explosion. The report stated that the recent extended period of rain caused unanticipated external loading on Atmos's piping system. The NTSB contracted with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to evaluate the technical accuracy of the consultant's preliminary assessment report. The Army Corps found that subsurface materials underlying the explosion block were highly uniform and there was no evidence of unanticipated external loading. Despite five leaks being discovered on its system on the explosion block, Atmos maintained that its consultant's evaluation of the area around and encompassing the explosion block was valid, but not specific to the location evaluated by the Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps further indicated that the high plasticity clay soils found in this area swell when saturated with water and shrink on drying. The associated movement tends to distress structures, such as buried piping. The tendency of clay soil to distress buried piping over time is not new. In fact, the NTSB investigated an explosion that occurred in 1971 in the North Richland Hills area of Texas, about 22 miles west of this explosion on Lone Star Gas Company system since acquired by Atmos. The NTSB determined that the dense clay soil had exerted stresses on the pipe through the years every time rain saturated the soil sufficiently to cause it to swell, eventually breaking the embrittled pipe, allowing gas to escape, preventing the escaping gas from dissipating to the air above, and causing the gas to flow laterally into more porous, graveled soil under the driveway. Similar observations were made by a foundation ins inspector in the year prior to the explosion. 
He observed that the foundation of the explosion home had degraded and reported that high, highly plastic clay soils, typically found in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, can distress structures over time due to expansion and contraction caused by seasonal moisture changes. The foundation was repaired in 2017. The large number of leaks around the explosion site prompted further evaluation of PHMSA's gas distribution pipeline integrity management requirements as they pertain to Atmos's system in the affected area. These requirements were promulgated in 2009 to enhance safety by identifying and reducing pipeline integrity risks. These requirements were noted to be responsive to recommendations from the Department of Transportation's Inspector General, who recognized in 2004 that natural gas distribution pipelines cannot be internally inspected, but noted that some elements of integrity management can be applied to this sector. The Department of Transportation's in Inspector General indicated that natural gas distribution pipelines we're not achieving the department's goal of reducing the number of transportation related fatalities and injuries, noting accidents in natural gas distribution pipelines had resulted in more fatalities and injuries than hazardous liquid and natural gas transmission lines combined. Data from 2014 through 2018 shows that this continues to be the case with about 84% of pipeline fatalities and injuries occurring in the gas distribution sector. The basic principle underlying integrity management is that operators should identify and understand the threats to their pipelines and apply their safety resources commensurate with the importance of each threat. In applying this performance-based requirement, PHMSA has indicated that operators that comply with an optional industry standard developed by the Gas Piping Technology Committee will comply with the rule. Although Atmos's distribution integrity management program was generally consistent with industry guidance, it did not adequately consider threats that were degrading its system, the likelihood of failure associated with these threats or the potential consequences of such a failure. Similarly, Atmos's periodic leak survey methodology and frequency complied with minimum state and federal requirements, but was not able to identify the degraded condition that was found after the explosion. The leak survey frequency was set based on prescriptive requirements. I did not consider the accuracy of the detection tools used or environmental factors that could affect gas migration, such as soil type and condition. Therefore, the staff has proposed recommendations to strengthen gas distribution integrity management programs. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the staff's presentations and we're prepared to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I want to thank the staff for those uh, presentations. We'll now turn to the board member questions and uh, Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could we uh, bring up uh, slide 49 again, please? And I look at this and the question is, we have two explosions uh, on the same block um, in two days. And it strikes me, I mean, the two lots next to the two house fires had category two leaks uh, prior to the fatal explosion. Now, would you explain again what category two leaks are? Sure. A category two leak is a leak that Amos's technician recognized had the potential to present a um, hazard in the future, a probable future hazard. Okay, so within 36 hours, four out of the seven properties on Durango either had gas explosions, fires, or gas leaks. So a question here, we, we found one crack in the, the main, which uh, uh, preceded the uh, uh, fatal explosion on uh, Espanola. Could the cracked main have fueled the first two fire explosions or was that too far away? Yeah, so so we looked into that because the cracked main was closer to the Espanola house 
from the cracked main to the Española house, the explosion house is about 170 feet to the actual house structure. For the first incident, it was about 380 feet. And for the second incident, it was about 230 feet. Um, there's actually previous NTSB investigation history. There's an accident in Bowie, Maryland in the 70s, 1973, where there was a leak that had been present for an uh, extended period of time, about five months. And um, the gas accumulated in gravel soil underneath the road, so it was prevented from um, venting to the atmosphere. And it, it migrated to form a reservoir of gas that was about 500 by 150 feet. And they, uh, in the emergency response activities, they actually had to vent 65 houses over a five block area. So natural gas can um, migrate pretty extensive di um, distances. It, it really depends on the specific circumstances. Okay, so I think we've established then that uh, uh, given the nature of the soil and everything, that the gas can migrate quite a distance. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that's correct. So I guess, uh, and uh, this is, I'm sure my colleagues will be asking the same question, but if you have multiple leaks and two houses that explode uh, or catch fire um, on the same block uh, within a couple of days of each other, um, what would be the optimal response to something like that? Well, in our view, especially once the second house fire occurred in the same alley, um, the the staff that was there didn't really have a lot of um, options or procedures, but upon looking at it and like res retrospectively, we felt that they should have shut down their pipeline system and um, tested it and considered evacuating the area. So, and I guess uh, we'll have some discussion about the uh, uh, Dallas uh, Fire Rescue sort of analysis of all of this, but uh, there seems to be a lot of difficulty in being able to identify, particularly in wet weather, uh, whether gas is present or not. Do we have any sense in, in terms of, uh, it was stated that the um, odorant can be stripped out when it goes through soil. Um, have any studies or much studying been done on that as to whether you should increase the amount of odorant or is there anything that could be done there? Sorry, I believe Ms. Gunaratnam can answer that. Uh, yes, uh, th we have noted in uh, previous NTSB investigations that odorant fade is a phenomenon that we, we've observed. Um, and we did some research into this and we have issued older recommendations um, that uh, address odorant fade and they've been closed acceptable. Um, PHMSA and, uh, and the industry have studied uh, odorant fade and we f they found that it varies based off of environmental conditions. Uh, odorant is stripped depending on the type of soil. Um, for example, high clay soils, high clay content soils um, can strip the odorant. Um, the type of piping can strip the odorant. So it varies on the environmental conditions. Okay, so that's something that maybe is worthy of additional uh, review. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Vice Chairman, you're quite welcome. Member Homedy. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm not sure, uh, probably Ms. McAtee and maybe uh, Ms. Lyons, I'll have uh, some questions for you. I, I want to I wanna actually start with Atmos's party submission to the NTSB. Um, and they said uh, the house fires at uh, the first two incidents in the two days preceding the explosion were not caused by gas leaking from the two inch steel main. Uh, they continue to call those house fires. Uh, and they state uh, that the NTSB never took custody of the two house fire sites to bring them officially into the investigation and that they shouldn't be part of our investigation. Can 
I, I guess Ms. Lyons or Mr. Hall, uh, can you respond to that? Sure, regarding the first two incident houses, it's it's true that we didn't secure those properties for the NTSB investigation, but there was always interest in those properties. In fact, on February 27th, just four days after the explosion and early in the on-site investigation, the NTSB and DFR worked together to, um, to, to gain permission from the homeowners to access their building, search the premises, and they and um, they gave permission also to remove samples of burned debris, anything that caused or contributed to the spread of fire or any other evidence that was relevant to the cause of the fire. DFR and the NTSB only took photographs during that um, investigation, but they took many photographs um, that was necessary for Ms. McAtee's later evaluation. So we did document the the what what we saw at those two houses. We documented those two scenes, mm -hmm. and then we did uh, uh, interviews uh, to talk to the fire firefighters and to talk to the arson investigators and to Atmos uh, following those. Correct. That's correct. And uh, Miss McAtee, how do we know? Uh, uh, so Atmos says that the first one was the result of a gas heater. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. And how do we know that? The gas heater that they are referring to came from a reference in the DFR's arson investigation report stating that a gas heater in the addition bathroom was the source of gas for the explosion at 3527. However, there was no evidence that there was a gas heater in that bathroom. The gas and heater was in the original bathroom in the original structure. It was intact and not fire damaged. And my and my understanding is that there was some miscommunication at the time between the arson investigator, the home, the person who was injured in the home was transported to the hospital because of uh, severe injury. And uh, uh, she had interviewed the 15 year old son and there were some there was a bit of a language barrier and uh, it was understood, I believe, by the arson investigator that there was a gas heater, but then later determined that wasn't the case. That is correct. OK, and so how do we know there wasn't something wrong with the appliances? You mentioned three appliances in the home. How do we know there wasn't anything wrong with those? As far as the appliances in 3527, uh, they were not damaged. The gas range and the hot water heater from the first incident, uh, there was no, they weren't even fire damaged. They were not even anywhere near the area where the fire occurred. The only appliance that sustained any kind of thermal related damage was the HVAC unit, which was located in the attic. And uh, two questions in my little bit of time left. Can you once again talk about you know, when you see a blue flame, that's right. When you see a red, red or orange, not good. And uh, can you talk about the difference there? And then also you mentioned that the fire, the fire damage was not consistent with a structure fire, that it was, con that it was more consistent with a natural gas fueled fire. If you can talk about those two things and then uh, afterwards uh, the chairman can take take back over. Yes. Um, the presence of anything other than a blue flame in a gas appliance, particularly a stove, indicates a problem. Um, oftentimes an orange or a red flame can indicate uh, that the gas uh, air mixture is not proper, that it's too rich, there's too much fuel. Um, it could be the presence of a contaminant, um, but usually it, it has more to do with the balance of the gas to air ratio and how it's burning. And so that's why you always want the blue flame. Anything else usually indicates that there's too much gas and that there could be a problem with the appliance or introduction of gas from an outside source. Mm -hmm. I guess in the next round for me, I'll, I'll ask you to describe the difference, of how you determined that the damage was not consistent with a structure fire, but we can wait till the next, till okay. my next round. Thank you. 
Member Hamdi, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Member Graham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to start uh, going back to the initial investigation of the uh, the first incident on 3527 3, Durango, the reported explosion and fire. And I want to ask about the Dallas Fire and Rescue arson investigator um, as to uh, how long were they on the scene? Do we know how long they were on the scene before they made their preliminary uh, results uh, to the Atmos uh, technician? So we know that they were requested by the incident commanders and arrived soon after. Um, and they, uh, after the fire was extinguished, they were there. Um, and for 3527, that fire was extinguished within 30 minutes. So we know that they had arrived on scene sometime uh, after that. Um, I'm not sure how long they were on scene, um, but they had been there uh, uh, interviewing the family members and uh, documenting the house itself. And they overlapped with the service technician who had been there for 30 minutes. So okay. well, the time. I guess my question is, is how long does it take to come to a preliminary result? Um, it seemed like it was a pretty quick um, preliminary uh, result that they had come up with, uh, that they let the technician know what they thought the uh, cause of the uh, explosion and fire was. Is that fairly normal to be able to come up with the preliminary result that quick? Uh, well, actually, I would uh, defer to Ms. McAtee on that. I, I would say no, because it, as you can see with Ms. McAtee, she, she did a more thorough investigation um, with the fire analysis of both homes. To answer your question, it really depends on the nature of the fire. Um, it could be something as simply as food on the stove, you walk in, you see a burned pot. It's pretty obvious that's the cause. Something like this, however, um, probably would require a little more in-depth investigation. I do know it, they made some of their conclusions based on their initial interviews, which usually is a good indication of what happened. Um, but sometimes, as in this case at 3527, the residents were asleep except for the homeowner who was in the attic when the uh, HVAC unit exploded. Um, so they really didn't know what happened and he was at the hospital. So um, you always have your initial thoughts as a, as a fire investigator when you're first on scene, um, but they are always changing as you are developing more facts and getting more information. Okay, thank you. I like to stay with you there. So it, it seemed like it was a, a quick result for a preliminary and even later on they they were still under that conclusion I, as you have all stated that they thought that was the uh, the source now i want to ask a question about source when you i'm not a fire investigator but do you look when you look at a, a fire and explosion are they looking for the fuel source and an ignition or are they looking one or the other cuz in this case it looks like they really didn't break it up as to figure out where the fuel source and the ignition it came from on the first incident. So to do an investigation as per nine, NFPA 921, which is a guideline for fire investigations, um, you want to do the best um, job of being able to identify both an ignition source and a fuel source. They have to be close enough to one another for the, you know, the ignition source to ignite the fuel source. Uh, the other thing that you should also do is eliminate any possible ignition sources or fuel sources. If you can't eliminate them, then they get lumped into your possible area. If there are quite a few fuel sources, quite a few ignition sources, you're unable to eliminate any of them. That's usually how you end up with an undetermined cause. Okay, so in the case of the first incident, what was the fuel source? What did they say? What did Dallas Fire and Rescue Arson investigators, based investigators say the fuel source and the ignition source was? A gas heater in the bathroom of the addition. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I see my time's about up, uh, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're quite welcome, Member Graham and Member Chapman. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I certainly I join in expressing our profound sympathies to those that were harmed uh, by this incident. I uh, thank all of our team for the hard work. My questions are intended to uh, further refine my own understanding of what is admittedly a complicated factual basis for the conclusions that we've drawn from the investigation. The two house fires which preceded the explosion at 3534 uh, Espanola Drive, they were at locations further away from the leak in the two, e two inch steel main. Would, I don't know, I don't know that much about how gas performs or, or, the, or the properties of gas. Would dangerous levels of leaking gas have been more likely to accumulate closer to the leak rather than further away? Okay, so it really depends on the um, environmental conditions and the, the condition of the soil. Like if you have a sand, it might be a um, more likely um, path for the gas to migrate compared to clay soil, especially if it's wet. Um, in fact, we, we have a, a, a um, previous NTSB investigation kind of highlights that. There was a accident in uh, Annandale, Virginia in 1972 where there were six houses on a street that ended in a cul-de-sac. So they were mostly on the cul-de-sac. Cul there was a, a um, gas leak, it was a very short period of time, this one, um, the, because it was related to construction. So the gas leak happened, there wasn't an evacuation, and the gas actually migrated to one of the farther homes first, causing an explosion at a home that was 240 feet away. Later, two of the other homes on that cul-de-sac exploded as well and three were unharmed. Afterwards there was there was a lot of um, activity to understand gas migration with tracer gas and and they did evaluation of the soil conditions showing that the gas can actually migrate in utility trenches around in like the backfill around the sewer pipe without entering the sewer um, and um, depending on the soil construction on the property itself, uh, it would preferentially go to um, one house or the other. It's just going to take the path of least resistance. Um, thank you. That's very helpful. Did, did our investigation determine a pathway by which leaking gas might have migrated from the crack in the two inch main to the locations of the first two house fires? So, we didn't take measurements of that. We don't have the measurements to link it, but we did. We we did look at the you know infrastructure in that alley, and it, it appeared that there was a significant amount of sandy backfill around the sewer lateral, which was just above the cracked main, as well as around the um, sewer main itself, which ran the full length of the alley. So that appeared to be the most um, likely porous soil path just based on the look of the neighborhood. Okay, all right. Uh, and as member Hamandi pointed out in its in its party submission, Atmos asserts that the two house fires which occurred in the two days preceding the explosion were not caused by leaking gas from the two inch steel main. Is that in conflict with the conclusion of our investigation team or or can those two perspectives be reconciled in some way? So we didn't conclude that that crack actually caused the two <clears throat> explosions. Um, we concluded that it, it that the leaks on Atmos's system were likely related to the f first two houses. But we there were so many leaks in the area um, that it, it's difficult to identify the exact source. OK, so our conclusion is not definitively that the first two events were related to the crack in the two inch main, is that is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, and again, as, as, as member Hamidi noted, we did not take uh, custody of the two prior house fire sites um, to bring them officially into the investigation, correct? We, we did bring the house fire sites into the investigation and it's actually documented in our preliminary report. The, the way that they came in is that the focus of the investigation is on the fatal explosion house and the scope of our investigation also included determining whether those first two incidents were related. 
Okay, but we did not secure those two sites, is that right? We didn't secure the two sites, okay. that's correct. All right. uh, and we relied on photographs, uh, uh, interviews. Uh, there was no forensic analysis of any kind, F physical, physical examination of any of the um, components or appliances. Well, um, actually, there there were some. Um, OK, so during the on site response, there there were NTSB investigators that went physically to th those homes. Um, and then later, actually much later, we did obtain the um, whereabouts of the appliances that were in the homes. And Ms. McAtee could discuss that if, if you'd like. But, um, that's all right. My my time is up. I might I might circle back around, uh, but that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You are quite welcome, Member Chapman. Uh, so Mr. Hall, um, as I noted in my opening statement, we're just one month shy of three years since this investigation occurred. Uh, I'm sorry, since this uh, accident occurred, and I can only imagine the challenges that your investigative team may have on something like this, very complex factors. I'd like to hear some of the challenges and reasons that uh, an investigation like this might take as long as it did. Well, there were a number of challenges, as you've indicated. Uh, one of the first challenges was that after this, this incident occurred, we had Merrimack Valley and the initial indication of Merrimack Valley was that there were national ser serious national implications that needed to be addressed quickly. And because of that and because of the limitations of our staff, we only have three pipeline investigators. Uh, the decision was made to uh, minimize this investigation during the time that we were conducting the Merrimack Valley investigation. We then picked it up again after Merrimack Valley, but there were also issues uh, in this past year due to COVID, which delayed our ability to uh, do further investigation of the appliances. Uh, so those two things uh, are primarily uh, 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 the reasons for the delay in, in this investigation. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate your answer. Um, I'm not sure exactly who who I would uh, direct this this next question to, but when when we talk about the house at 3527 Durango, so this was two days prior to the explosion that happened at 3534 Espanola. So we had a, a, a the Atmos technician performed one bar hole test but he could not insert his, his uh, uh, CGI probe all the way into the hole because the ground was wet. The, the hole was basically filled with water. So if you can't put your probe in uh, to the hole there, does that give you a, does that give you a legitimate test? And the whole idea of the hole is to drill the hole and then stick your probe down into it. So Ms. Lyons, what are your thoughts on that? Sure. I mean, well, when they're testing uh, with their CGI, their their test, we we tested the equipment that they had after, and it was fine. But the test can only measure what you're, you know, what you're sampling, so it wouldn't give you an accurate indication of the subsurface atmosphere. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's what I was getting at is that uh, the purpose of the drilling the hole or barring the hole is to stick the probe down to it to see what the subsurface gas is. And if you can't really do that, then maybe you're not getting a, you're not really doing a thorough test. Did I phrase that properly? Yes. Thank you. What proof did the Atmos service technician have that the leak was in the customer's house? Well, why did he come to that determination? So based on the records that we had and discussions um, with him, it's the evidence that he had was the testing that you just were discussing and the um, discussion that he had with the arson investigator from DFR. They told him that the leak, I think the language was probably was an inside leak or probably was associated with the, yeah, so preliminary information that was caveated. Would it be fair to think to say that possibly the Atmos service technician's opinion was biased by what he heard from the DFR 
uh, arson investigator because that's um, what he was told. You know, he was asked in an NTSB interview whether he thought that the um, gas came from the customer piping, and he said that he couldn't make that determination because he didn't test the customer piping. So I don't know that I would say it was biased. I don't know that he had come to a conclusion there. Yeah, or maybe influenced. Maybe that's a better word. Uh, he may have been influenced by what the arson investigator uh, had told him. Um, let me ask you this uh, real quickly. Um, did the DFR, Dallas Fire Rescue, did they properly investigate the fire at uh, 3527 Durango? Should they have had a, a, a specialist trained with gas leaks? Ms. Gunratnam? Uh, yes, I, I believe they could have, um, the arson investigators could have done a more thorough job uh, with the information they received from the occupants in the structures. Um, they could have verified which appliance uh, may have contributed to the gas leak if that was what they were told. Uh, so I think it would assist them if they had um, maybe some natural gas, specific natural gas training, um, or they could have uh, g received the assistance of their hazardous materials team who does have that specific training already. Very good, thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, everybody on the panel, my colleagues and the staff, uh, I was thinking that we would go another round before we take a break, but if you really need a break, we usually take our breaks about right now. Um, Carla, see you've got your hand raised to remind me that I'm out of time. Who, if you feel the need to take a break right now, uh, raise your hand. Um, again, I think we would be about 11.15, 11.20 before we took our break if we went for another round. Okay, uh, seeing, no, seeing no hands, we will uh, go back for the second round of questions. And Vice Chairman Landsberg, you're you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Ms. Gunnarotnam, uh, following up on the uh, chairman's uh, questions uh, regarding the Dallas Fire Rescue uh, training uh, and the arson arson people, um, are they given any training relative to the whole concept of odor fading, which I think we see is kind of a, a key portion to all of this? So I, I don't, with regard to nat general natural gas training, I know that the arson investigators, when they're first certified, uh, they have to receive some building fuel gas uh, system uh, training. And I know that's part of the curriculum in their initial certification. So that may cover odor fade, I'm not sure. Um, however, it's specified in a various NFPA standards. And so unless they were trained in accordance to those standards, which I'm not aware of, and when asked in interviews, um, the arson investigators uh, reported that they never received training with the gas company. So I'm not sure that they're aware of uh, odor fade. Yeah, that, that would seem to be a, a, a key element here because usually uh, uh, if you have a gas leak, people tend to think that you're going to notice the odorant and, and therefore th that's an early warning tip off of, of something going wrong. Thank you. Uh, next question is uh, from Mr. Zakhar. Um, do we have any idea as to when the uh, service main uh, cracked, uh, the through wall crack that you uh, uh, gave us a very detailed explanation of? Uh, at, at this time, no, we did not determine when the crack uh, penetrated the wall, only that the uh, crack was open for an extended uh, period of time. So is it possible, I'm not trying to lead the witness here, but is it possible that the main had been leaking during a prior uh, leak survey performed by Atmos uh, uh, in March of 2017, which is, of course, less than a year prior to the explosion? Is, is that conceivable? Uh, yes, there, there's a possibility for that. that there's a possibility that uh, a small portion of the crack could have penetrated the wall, releasing only a, a small amount of gas, but the flow rates could have been small enough and not been detected. So there, there is that possibility. Okay. 
could we bring up slide 50, please? And we, we noticed in slide 50 that there were, uh, I believe it was 741 grade one and two leaks. Um, uh, Ms. Lyons, could you explain what a grade one leak is? Sure. So a grade one leak is a leak that Atmos's technician determined presented a um, an actual or probable hazard. OK, in looking at this this uh, uh, figure, is this a normal kind of profile uh, to to see something like that? That looks to me like there's an awful lot of, of uh, leakage there. It's it's not normal. Um, so 741 leaks over five weeks in this area was was unusual. It's, I mean, at least an order of magnitude higher than what you'd normally see. Do we have any sense of how long this level of leakage might have been going on? We really don't know. We did review Atmos's previous leak survey data um, and not for this whole area, because this was um, really beyond the focus of the investigation. This came came up later, but um, but the, you know it didn't appear from their leak data that there was a um, high rate of leakage in the area. So we don't know if there was an issue with the implementation of previous leak surveys or um, when exactly this began. One of the things that uh, I think uh, Atmos had mentioned was that they contracted with a, a consultant to look at uh, the fact that there was unprecedented rainfall. Um, is is that the case? I mean, it, it rains a lot in Dallas uh, periodically. I've lived down there, and uh, I'm just I'm just curious. Uh, was there anything unusual about the atmospheric conditions or the the soil conditions that anybody could identify? I mean, they had a lot of rain around the time of the incident. So it was, I think, February 20th to the 22nd was a three day high for February. Um, we looked at weather in Dallas at other times of the year, and um, that was not really unusual for the area. The amount of rain they had over that three day period might happen about every other year or so on average uh, since the, the um, distribution system we were interested in had been installed. OK, very good. I'll stop here, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You're quite welcome. And uh, Member Homedy. Thank you. And uh, I'm getting texts that I guess our public transmission of the board meeting somehow isn't occurring. So whoever deals with that, hopefully somebody's on top of that. Um, but uh, a couple of I, I want to go back to the first incident. Um, and the work of the arson investigator. The arson investigator, we've, uh, I had asked Ms. McAtee earlier about the miscommunication that occurred between the arson investigator and the 15-year-old son. There was a, a language barrier. There was misunderstanding that uh, a gas heater uh, might have been the uh, source and uh, there was likely some uh, that influenced the arson investigators uh, decision to note at the time that the that the uh, the initial report or initial determination was ac actually accidental and wasn't changed until undetermined until some time later. And in fact, when, uh, when did the arson investigator uh, interview the, uh, it, it, the homeowner that was injured and in the hospital and found out that it was actually the HVAC system? Uh, so I, oh. I can answer that question. Um, it was about a week later. Uh, the arson investigator, it was March, I believe March 7th. Um, the arson investigator had visited uh, the uh, occupant who was in the hospital. Right. 
And so, you know, at that time, I had asked, uh, I met with Dallas Fire, and they said it's not unusual to have uh, one thing on the preliminary determination and that change over the course of an investigation. I think that's much like our investigations. In fact, if I'm correct, we weren't sure the two uh, incidents were related until our investigation progressed. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So things change over the course of an investigation. It changed over the course of our investigation. So it seems like it would also change over the course of an arson investigation. Uh, in fact, according to NFPA 921, it says the use of a systemic approach often will uncover new factual data for analysis, which may require previous conclusions to be reevaluated. And the chief of the ar arson investigation told me that a uh, when I asked how long does an arson investigation take, he said as long as it takes and dependent on the ability to gather information. In fact, in our interviews, uh, I believe the chief of staff, Ted Paget, Paget for the um, um, uh, Dallas fire had stated, you know, in when we asked in hindsight, on that first incident, knowing what was known at the time by the arson investigators, would anything have changed if anything, everything went perfectly? And the answer was no, because there were other things that they were looking at. So my question to you is, uh, obviously, the, I, I do believe there should have been some gas monitoring, but my question to you is, what is Atmos's responsibility? Who's responsible for pipeline safety and leak detection. That, that would be Atmos. Atmos. So uh, Ms. Lyons, if I can keep you on. So at this time, they really had not looked for a leak. They could not go into the structure. And I understand it's not in their procedures, but wouldn't we think it might be a good idea to come back and look? Yeah, definitely, definitely, because in the response to fire and explosions, it would be expected to have a um, DFR there in Dallas. Right. OK, I think, you know, I start to question when we get to the second incident. At that point, people should be thinking differently. Um, and I do want to get into that in the uh, second round. Um, what more, but let me ask, what more could Atmos have done on that first, at, at, at that first incident? Well, a, a couple of things they could have done. Um, they could have tested the customer piping, obviously. That's not always an option, um, but actually at this house, there's a, there's a riser near the house and at the meter because the customer piping runs across the yard. So even if the internal piping was damaged, they could have tested that. Um, in this case, it turned out they could have also tested the customer piping all the way to the appliances because that was later done. Um, in addition, they um, could have thought about testing the environment and the crawl space because that would be a likely vent path. It would be expected to be more dry or trying to do a bar hole in there if they had access and could do it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome, Member Hamadi and uh, Member Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I kind of want to stay on that a little bit uh, from what Member Hominy was was asking about. Uh, what did the Atmos technician do in the uh, first incident at 3527 three, Durango? Uh, what did they do or what did that technician do to investigate uh, the uh, explosion and fire? Yeah, so he um, he did attempt to do one bar hole test using a, a modified technique, and he he looked in the alley for bubbles, and he surveyed with his gas monitoring tool over the the soil, the saturated soil and water, and he spoke with the arson investigator. Okay, so and I think our, our report says he was on the scene about thirty minutes. That's correct. Okay. Um, what does what are Atmos's procedures uh, for employees responding to a scene like this? What do those procedures say to do? Yeah, so their procedure calls for a full leak investigation when access to the premises is allowed and when it's practical. Um, they do not require the 
technician to stay there until it's practical, they don't require them to come back. And they don't require them to come back. I think mm -hmm. that's that's important. Um, in both incidents, did Atmos perform pressure tests on the customer piping in either incident at no. 3527 or 3515? No, they did not. They did not. Okay. Um, it's the uh, so their procedures say that their technicians don't need to wait to perform any customer piping pressure testing or return to a the scene after the fire department leaves that's correct do we know if their procedures have changed since then i'm not aware of a change to that portion of their procedures okay um does atmos leak detection procedures incorporate the american gas association's gas piping technology committee recommendations that call for sampling the atmosphere of the crawl space for the presence of combustible gases they did not it does not okay do we have a recommendation for that we have a recommendation related to improving their procedures um that that would it's it specifically indicates looking at um, the most likely gas migration path, I believe. So that would that would be intended to cover that. And to cover that, and I think I think I read that in the uh, draft uh, of the recommendation. So, so if I'm an Atmos customer and I smell gas in my house and I call them. Um, are they going to do the same procedure, come out and do a, a similar procedure as they would if uh, as a post structure explosion and fire? Do their are their procedures different? Do we know? So they follow the same procedure for the the inside leak investigation. If but if you called them and you're there, you would be granting access to them. Presumably if you stayed and waited for the, their technician to arrive. That would give them the ability to um, test your customer piping and complete their full leak investigation um, for the house. OK, all right. Thank you very much. I see you got about a minute left. Um, I want to ask a question about uh, subsurface gas migration and how the uh, the soil works with that. The permeability of the soil could is somebody that can explain a little bit about how gas migrates through soil from like a leak in a, in a main in this case, and what um, water saturation can do to that. Can you somebody explain that for me? Sure, Ms. McAtee, do you want to take that? So depending on the soil um, type, it may trap or allow gas to move more freely. So obviously sandier soils, gravel, things with lots of void spaces is going to allow gas to move much more quickly than say really dense clay. Um, in this case, the water would have probably kept the gas from dissipating through the soil out into the atmosphere and trapped it in the ground itself. So that also would have led to it migrating further because it couldn't escape. OK, thank you very much. So this gas basically could have been, um, been leaking for some time in drier situation and just nobody noticed it. It wasn't detectable because maybe the odorant had faded going through the soil in a drier soil. That is very possible. OK, thank you. I see my time's up. Uh, back to you, Mr. Chairman. Member Grant, thank you very much. And uh, Member Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to pick up really on some questions that both member Hamadi and member Graham have, have raised um, regarding the likely relationship of the three events. And certainly I concur that there's a very low probability of two or three structure fires or explosions occurring independently on the same block during the same week. Based on that low probability and what the investigation has determined factually, it certainly at this point seems reasonable to conclude that the two prior house fires and the explosion were all likely related. Following the first two house fires, was enough information available for Atmos to conclude that the two events were related? Mr. 
Hmm. I, I think that they didn't have enough information to make that conclusion, but it's it's very unlikely. So I think they would have been on alert about it. However, um, had they done a thorough investigation of both houses, they they may have been there. They so may have had enough. It, it sounds like what you're saying is there was not a point at which it should have become obvious that the first two events were related, at least prior to the explosion. Is that right? Mr. Hall? Certainly when we became aware of it, of the two previous events, and that was a day or two after, uh, that was something that from my experience, it, you just don't see it. You don't see two houses have natural gas issues, you know, a day apart on the same street unless there's an external source. And that's really when we began looking at that very closely. Atmos did not sufficiently gather information during their investigation to be able to make that determination. But given the fact that it is a very unique and rare event to have these, these essentially simultaneous events, uh, they should have been looking much harder initially. Okay, okay. Um, a finding in the draft report concludes that Atmos should have been prompted to shut down its pipeline operations because its ability to reliably detect the presence of gas was limited. And that limitation was because of equipment and procedures and the impact of the wet weather conditions. Did the investigation determine when that decision to shut down pipeline operations should have been made? Or at this point, um, do, do we have do we have a sense of when that decision should have been made? Our team's opinion was that it it could have been made before the explosion occurred. So between the morning of the 22nd, as they're doing their investigation during the day, um, they they could have made that call. Now. You know, it's it's a hard decision to make, of course, because they do have to isolate all of the houses in their in their isolation area. And so that's going to be affecting their customers. They they don't want to be wrong about that. But of course, as Mr. Hall just indicated, this was a highly unusual circumstance. Um, agree, agree. And, I, and I'm, I'm sure that would have been a difficult decision to make. Um, uh, Unfortunate it wasn't made, uh, and I don't want to in any way suggest that it would have been a, a simple matter, but um, clearly that could have made an important difference uh, with respect to the uh, explosion itself. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, some questions about third party party damage. I'm going to hold those and yield back uh, my time and pursue them in a later round. Member Chapman, thank you very much. Um, so after the the second day, so this is the day before the the explosion at 3534 Espanola. So we're talking about a fire that was reported at 3515 Durango. Um, we had two survey uh, specialists who conducted uh, a leak survey. They they used the remote methane leak detector. Is that technique, is that device recommended for wet weather? No, it has limitations when there's con condensing water, so any rain in the atmosphere. As I understand it, uh, one of the survey specialists asked his supervisor how he was supposed to uh, use the RMLD when it was quote unquote pouring down rain. And do you recall what the supervisor's response was? Something like do Something the best you can. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Do the best you can. Now, in that day, by the way, um, when one of the techs reported that that he he found what he believed uh, to be a gas indication, one of the supervisors interpreted that reading as being a false positive. Um, how often would you get a false positive with either the CGI or the ML, um, the RMLD? So my understanding is that that would be a, a rare event, but they were operating in conditions they don't normally use that equipment in. Because of the, the wet weather, is that? That's right. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in total that day, so we're talking about the day before the explosion, Atmos identified four grade one leaks and nine grade twos in an eight block area surrounding what would later become the site of the, uh, the explosion. Uh, any thoughts about that? And that, that was a lot of leaks. Yeah, that's a lot of leaks. And again, we've, we've heard it several times, but a grade one is a leak that represents an existing or probable hazard to persons or property. I'll, I'll diverge just for a moment. Uh, you know, we've got, we, we now have two events, a, a few houses away from each other. And I know we've heard this and we've heard Mr. Hall say, it's very unusual to have, have, have fires in the same block that are both served by the same gas line. Back in 1967, NASA had a, uh, had a horrible event, killed three, three astronauts on Apollo 1. It was a flash fire. And uh, later Frank Borman was uh, directed to lead that investigation. And when he reported to the results to Congress, he said, this fire, this was, this was the, the result of a failure of imagination. And I'm going to propose that what we have here, the, the ultimate explosion that occurred on day three, on February the 23rd, was in fact a failure of imagination, a failure of various organizations to connect the dots and say, wow, we've got two fires on the same street. We're getting uh, four grade one leaks and nine grade two leaks uh, in this area. And so I think I'll just leave right there on that. We're going to take a break. Before we do take a break, I'd like to invite everyone to uh, turn off your cameras and your microphones and we will reconvene at 1130. That's about 17, about 13 minutes from now. We'll see you at 1130. We are in recess.
Well, we are back in session and we'll resume with questions from the board. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is probably a question either for Mr. Uh, Zakhar or uh, Ms. Lyons. How long should a steel pipeline last? And if I recall correctly, the, the service main here was installed in 1946. Yes, um, back in around the 1946 period of time, 1950s, the pipe were basically made from high strength, low alloy steel. And uh, the uh, coatings that you would find for that era are typically the coal tar coating. Uh, that's what typically you would find in that area. Uh, when it comes to how long do they last? Well, uh, that varies depending where in the country you're located. Uh, the service life varies greatly from, from one part of the, the country to the other. And it varies uh, greatly with the uh, location, the, the type of soil, the acidity in the soil, and the water content that has a great deal of uh, uh, effect on deteriorating the, uh, the pipe. Um, the external coatings, that's another factor. Um, coatings are applied differently by different companies. That has an effect on the longevity of the pipe. The procedure that is used to prepare the pipe before you put the coating is another factor. And then of course, then you've got your cathodic protection system, which could either, either be, uh, well, the, the, the uh, sacrificial anodes, which are located several feet to a few yards away, the distribution of those anodes. So all these have a, a big factor in the longevity of the pipe. So it's it's rather difficult uh, to, to give one specific uh, retirement life for a pipe. So some pipes have, have lasted for a great deal, a number of years in certain parts of the country. So it's, it's difficult to say when uh, uh, it's time to retire a pipe. That's basically a company decides financially if it's worth uh, maintaining and, and that basically is the driving factor. So you mentioned a number of different factors, most of which I would think would be fairly well known. So we see in the northwest part of Dallas that you have this uh, very plastic uh, clay type soil and, uh, and a lot of moisture, which is going to put a lot of flex on the pipe, as I understand it, versus maybe in, in Phoenix, it's going to be quite different in terms of it's a, a sandy, dry environment. And knowing all of that, wouldn't that give us some guidance in terms of when we might start to look uh, at uh, a replacement? Yeah, I, I think the decisions are basically uh, up to the company. It's a company by company basis based on their uh, history of failure and, and history of, of leaking. Uh, a company needs to decide, you know, at what point uh, uh, do you get to where you, you need to, to do that. and. And that's where the difficulty lies. The, uh, it's difficult to, to make a company replace a pipe when the next door neighbor, for example, may have a better performance or worse performance. It, it's still, it's, it's a company by company uh, decision. So uh, there's, unless, yeah, unless so there's are, no uh, general industry uh, guidelines or anything. And so is it, is it the, is it the industry's approach to run these things to failure and in some cases catastrophic failure before you decide you need to uh, uh, do a replacement is is it, how does that work? It's uh, again many companies don't drive uh, the pipes to failure they they look for leaks uh, but these these large ruptures do occur uh, uh, by surprise without any expectation but. Companies are required to put plans in place that project what the failure rate is, and it, it does still fall back on, on the company unless there's a regulatory requirement that asks them to replace a certain pipeline segment. But uh, again, I think it's from company to company. And Bob, do you have any? I think Director Hall has something he wants to yeah, add here. I think so. You know, in, in the industry, uh, they've identified certain types of of pipeline systems as having a higher risk and in need of replacement. So when we look at cast iron, 
when we look at bare steel in the ground, companies have programs replacing those pipes uh, because they've been identified as a higher risk. The uh, steel pipe that's coated with the coal tar epoxy or coal tar uh, coating just hasn't risen to that same level. If at some point it does, uh, I'm sure the industry will respond with a replacement program uh, overseen by the regulator. So, so there is a methodology there. Additionally, the di distribution integrity management program really is monitoring the health of the system and, and is intended to alert operators uh, when the problems are, are getting uh, out of hand. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just want to welcome Vice Chairman Landsberg and Member Homedy. Great. And Mr. Hall, please stay on because that was a perfect segue to my next two rounds on integrity management. Um, we have investigated a number of pipeline uh, uh, explosions and um, I hate to use the term accident uh, in distribution pipelines, transmission pipelines, both gas and hazardous liquid. And continually we see four main issues. Pipeline operators who don't know their system, who don't consider the threats to their system and appropriately mitigate those threats, who don't uh, use the right methods for inspecting their pipeline and a continual failure to shut down when uh, uh, all evidence is present that that's the best, safest decision. And so I, in, in 2006, Congress, and I worked on the legislation, Congress uh, required PHMSA to prescribe minimum standards for integrity management programs for distribution pipelines. There was already a program in place for gas and hazardous liquid transmission. Um, the uh, part of uh, an integrity management program, which is managing the, in the integrity of your pipeline system, is knowing your system. Uh, and FIMSA lays out five areas of what needs to be considered, uh, but the one I want to focus on is whether pipelines need to know about previous incidents on their system. Does that help you? Is that something that they should be looking at that they're required to look at as part of knowing their system? Yes, they do need to look at prior incidents. And we have, uh, we made a recommendation to FIMSA regarding guidance out of Millersville to look at external sources, one of which is NTSB reports because in each of these major accidents, we found that the information was known, it was there. Uh, in San Bruno, when the, the delay, re delay responses were so great, uh, we pointed them to a 30 year report earlier that said that they had problems in delay responses. Uh, in the uh, Merrimack Valley, uh, the problems that they had, they had had the exact same incident. In fact, it was the very first report by the NTSB was the same company and the same type of incident. Uh, here we have the uh, Lone Star Gas that detailed the, the soil conditions and the issues with the soil conditions. And after this incident, they act like it was a surprise uh, that the soil conditions so there is a wealth of information if you just go look for it. And what was the, and that that recommendation to FIMSA out of Millersville? Did they do anything on it? Uh, yes, my understanding is it's closed acceptable. Okay, good. Um, on the Lone Star uh, uh, re report, which we did in 1972, I think the uh, incident was uh, in on October 4th, 1971 in North Richland Hills, which I looked on the map in Texas is directly west of uh, Española Drive, 23 miles on the other side of the airport. And so that, ac that accident actually involved 
not just um, some gas migration, but at the time we actually talked about heavy rain in Dallas. And I'm hoping that uh, the chairman pops up at one minute because I forgot to time myself. But we did we did talk about how on on those days, and in fact, the month leading up to it had more than normal rain. So uh, and and in my next um, round, I'm going to go into some of the threats. But knowing your pipeline is key and he and knowing the incidents. And one thing I want to point out is there were 26 failures or leaks on this system, 12, 13 identified prior to the explosion on February 23rd, 13 afterwards. And uh, my understanding is for 11 of those that uh, Atmos did not deter, did, did not even look. They just replaced the system. They replaced the pipeline. They didn't even look why they were leaking. What was the cause of those leaks? It's Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. Yeah, and so under the regulations, they are actually required to develop procedures for determining um, uh, 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 failure causes. And in the Gas Piping Technology Committee, they, they uh, suggest considering investigating any other failure that enables the operator to establish patterns that might be occurring on its pipeline system. And in this case, I think they lost a valuable opportunity to uh, look at causes of leaks uh, uh, that could inform them going forward to determine threats. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll uh, wait to the next round. Great, thanks for a great line of questioning. And uh, Member Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to talk about the capability of, or ask some questions about the capability of the devices in the wet weather to detect uh, gas. Um, after the first incident, the uh, Atmos technician proceeded to the gas meter outside the home to check for a leak and he used a bar hole test. He used a single hole. Um, in the case of wet weather and rain, uh, by puncturing a hole in the ground, it just fills with water. So um, what are the limitations of doing a bar hole test in this case? So, you know, the limitation is that he can't insert his device into the water environment. That'll damage his device. So he can only take the measurement where he can, you know, put his device without getting it wet. That's okay. the limitation. So that's where he's going to take the measurement. Okay, take the measurement. So uh, technically, he he only did one test, correct? He did one test, and then he he did survey. Survey above okay. ground, above the water. And then after the second uh, incident at 3515 Durango, uh, Atmos began leak detection uh, and they did observe bubbles outside the res residence. And uh, what are the bubbles, what are they telling us? The gas, the gas company technicians typically look for bubbles as a um, possible indication of gas. Okay, so however, upon further inspection, they did bar hole test and they used the uh, combustible gas indicator to test that and they did not confirm or did Atmos confirm uh, the presence of gas outside the residence when they did the bar holes after the second incident? No. No, they didn't. As a matter of fact, the service technician indicated that the, the combustible gas indicator, the CGI surveying over the top of the water near the riser did not result in any positive gas readings. He also indicated he did bar holes on both sides, both directions of the meter at 3515. So here we had some visible signs of a leak, but given the wet and rainy conditions, the bar hole testing design to detect the presence of gas cannot. So moreover, Atmos employees knew that their testing equipment was substandard in the rain and results were inaccurate. Um, do we know, uh, do you know what the survey technician number two that was uh, uh, statement was taken, what he told them NTSB investigators about how to close, uh, they were, how close they were putting the detectors to the ground? I don't recall that off the top yeah, of my head. They, they, they just, they were, they were basically stated, we usually just test it above the ground. We put our detectors as close to the hole as we can 
getting without getting it wet because getting it wet would ruin the uh, the equipment correct that's correct so and if they're puncturing a hole in the ground in wet and raining conditions and as some of the pictures show there's a lot of standing water already you puncture a hole it's going to fill up with water so it 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 does no good trying to detect subsurface gas in this case is that correct yeah, I mean, if they can't measure subsurface, they are yeah. not getting the valid indication. Yeah, matter of fact, I think even one of the technicians described it as kind of bar holding, holding and kind of surveying in this case. So I think after that, they went and they went ahead and brought out the uh, remote methane leak detectors. After that, the RMLD devices, and um, these. Matter of fact, some of the survey, the technicians said that these are the best to detect leak in the rain. But yet looking in the manual, uh, it says it can be used in light rain conditions. But in this case, um, it also can have uh, spurious indications due to uh, the strong reflection of large raindrops in this case or water droplets. So um, in either case, both of these are only detecting gas above the surface. They're not detecting gas subsurface. Is that correct? That's right. OK, so in that case, I see I'm running out of time. What is their other option if these devices don't work to, to detect subsurface gas leaks? I mean, they can try to find a likely vent path, a, a dry space. They could they in their procedure, it calls for them to take multiple bar holes, but if they you know, don't have another place nearby that they can take a bar hole. They don't really have a lot of options. OK, um, I, I see my time's up. I'll come back to this. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Member Graham and Member Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, third party damage is referenced in the proposed probable cause that we'll discuss in a while yet there isn't much discussion of third party damage within the body of the draft report. There's some, but but there's not a lot. And further, the, the draft proposes 14 new safety recommendations and it would re re reiterate three previous recommendations, but none of the new or reiterated recommendations included in the draft relate to third party damage. Um, if the investigation determined that third party damage was a key element in causing the explosion, would it be useful to focus more attention on how to ensure third party damage is avoided? So, so excavation damage and particularly third party excavation damage is a significant safety concern in the pipeline industry. So it's, it's very important. So we did look into um, how that relates to this particular incident um, and Based on our estimate, the most likely time that the excavation damage occurred was when the sewer um, system was replaced in 1995. We got some records from the city of Dallas related to that work, and it showed that the excavation crew that was a contractor of the city of Dallas um, was on site as well as a city of Dallas construction inspector. So it's two entities represented with multiple people um, at the at the time that the lateral was replaced. Um, since that time, so so what can we know about that, right? We can know that they were using heavy construction equipment near the natural gas main because the, the contact was made as, as Frank Sekar was discussing earlier. And we also um, we don't necessarily know if they reported the damage to the operator or not. We know that they had drawings, that they had the operator's phone numbers on those drawings, so they would have easily been able to make contact um, had they decided to. Um, but since that time, there's been a lot of work in the excavation damage prevention world and pipeline safety um, through even the NTSB did a safety study that, of course, the National 811 call before you dig number um, and the Common Ground Alliance and, and, and other organizations as well coming together to try to minimize the um, excavation damage, which continues to be a safety issue. 
Um, one of the things that was done in that time is in 2007, the Railroad Commission established some new rules related to excavation damage prevention. And one of the rules says that, you know, well, first, you're not supposed to, you're not allowed to use heavy construction equipment in close proximity to a natural gas main. That's for certain, and that's in their rules. But but the thing that stood out to the team was that um, you're required to report damage to the pipeline. So if there's an excavation company, they damage the pipeline and they don't make that report, that's one thing. But in this case, since there was also a city of Dallas inspector, we felt that it was likely that, that if that same situation occurred again in the future, that somebody would have made a report. And the report now doesn't just go to the pipeline operator, it would also go to the Railroad Commission. So that's kind of the rationale. So on a broader level, um, setting aside the specifics of the of this accident itself, um, ha have got and, and um, I'm interested in your your opinion on this. Ha have government and industry done enough to ensure third party damage is avoided? I mean, it's a major issue still. It's a it's a dominant cause of accidents across the industry. It's very important. So no, there's still work to do. There's a lot of work going on. There's a lot that's been done and there's still more to do. Are there other measures we could recommend uh, either today or at some later point uh, that would help avoid the sort of third party damage that's linked to this tragedy? I mean, I think that study on that topic could warrant safety improvements. Okay, all right, Mr. Chairman, I, I just, I wanna suggest that that's something that we should perhaps take a closer look at. Um, perhaps uh, uh, separate and apart from this report, but this seems to be obviously an, an element in this accident. And uh, if the, if this continues, if it's, if, it's, if it's agreed that this is a continuing problem, it's certainly something that we should examine. Thank you. Yes, sir, thank you very much. Uh, along those lines, uh, Mr. Hall, um, what work has the NTSB done regarding uh, second party damage or third party damage, excavation damage in general? Well, it's certainly been part of our uh, investigations when it occurs. And, uh, you know, as as Sarah was mentioning, we did a study uh, which occurred actually just shortly after we believe this, this damage occurred. Uh, the Common Ground Alliance was stood up. Uh, they uh, specify a number of recommended practices to be used. Uh, state laws have been strengthened. Uh, it's one of the things that uh, FIMSA looks for in certifying a state pipeline agency is that they have uh, state laws uh, governing uh, third and second party damage uh, and that they enforce those laws. Uh, there is another ongoing investigation right now where we're looking at that, the San Francisco uh, investigation. Uh, so a great deal of progress has been made and the rate of third party damage has gone down, uh, but there's still more to be done. I mean, uh, and, it, and it really gets to getting people to make the one call, getting people to report damage. Uh, you know, those are kind of the primary areas of focus. Is it correct that, uh, and I believe it is, but uh, but maybe I'm wrong, the third party, that excavation damage is the leading cause of pipeline uh, failures. Is that is that correct? Uh, it has been for many years. I believe there was a recent year where it became number two. Okay. Uh, second to corrosion, but uh, there there is definitely a trend of reduction of, of third party damage. Good, thank you very much for those answers. So I want to go back to, um, to the investigative staff uh, I want to talk about the, um, so we're still on the on day two. So this is the, the day before the explosion. We had a, um, a fire event at 3515 Durango. And, um, and after that, Atmos really, uh, I believe they really did uh, start putting a great deal of effort into trying to figure out what was going on. I believe uh, at one time they had five techs out there, five uh, service techs, I believe. Um, and, and in fact, I believe they were even, there were technicians out there even the morning of the 23rd when the explosion at 35, 34 Espanola 
occurred. So they were they were they were staffing it. But what more could they have done at this point? What actions do we believe that Atmos should have taken uh, at this point? We believe they should have shut down the system. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, I believe we we sh we said they should have evacuated the houses and prevented access to those houses and the emergency shut down. And and uh, and of course they did not do that. Now I realize that we have the advantage of 2020 hindsight, and uh, and it's easy for us to sit back and say they could have, would have, should have. But as as has already been stated, there are a great deal of considerations that have to be undertaken before shutting down a pipeline system. Uh, if you if your electrical system, uh, if the electrical utility has a problem, they can just shut off the electricity and when they turn it back on, then clocks in the in the in the houses will be blinking and, and that's about the biggest consequence of that if it's just a fairly short short shutdown. But for a gas pipeline system to be shut down, what complications are involved with bringing the system back up again? They have to go through and relight all the pilot lights. Is that correct? What else? Anything else? That's correct. Yeah, I mean, it's not just a switch, right? They have their valves, so they, they may have to do some excavation work associated with that, reconnect all of their customers and, and then relight pilots. Yeah, and, and we know the temperature was uh, had been in the 30s, the 40s, in the very low 50s throughout this period of time. And so it would have been very cold. And uh, so if you shut off the gas and you haven't relit all the pilot lights, then that creates uh, problems as well. So I do understand, at least uh, intellectually speaking, that that's a big decision to shut off a pipeline. However, in this particular case, that unfortunately is what needed to occur and did not occur. So we'll go to the uh, next round of questions and Vice Chairman Landsberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've we've talked a lot of, about a lot of different things here, and one area that I think we've had great success in in uh, preventing injuries in in house fires and so on is the advent of residential smoke detectors. So I'd like to ask a question about the fact that we've now seen that odor odorant depletion. Uh, or fade can be a significant problem under certain circumstances. What's the status of home um, methane detectors? And uh, is there something that can be done there? Ms. Kudnaratnam can, can answer that. So uh, currently the technology is commercially available. Um, and we discovered that during the uh, Silver Spring investigation a couple of years ago. Um, uh, so there's, uh, it, the problem is that as they've been studying, as the industry has been studying this technology, they found that there were some issues with the installation and proper maintenance and testing of this equipment. And so there needs to be a standard, an industry standard, to oversee the proper operation of the of the alarms to to prevent false, po you know, um, false alarms and such. So, uh, since that uh, we issued that recommendation out of the Silver Spring investigation, our safety rex group's actually been following this uh, in detail. But uh, NFPA and uh, the International Coal Council who developed these standards um, are currently uh, developing, NFPA is uh, developing a, a separate standard that oversees this technology and they've started the uh, c development of the first draft of that standard and it's uh, scheduled to be released in 2023. I would like to see a, you know, a higher uh, level of enthusiasm on that because uh, I think it would be really important for uh, people to have these detectors, as I say, we've we've learned that smoke and fire detectors in in houses have been a huge game changer in, in terms of preventing uh, fatalities. And in this situation, uh, had these devices been installed near the appliances or uh, in the crawl spaces, uh, that probably would have precluded uh, most, if not all, of this. Um, what about the building codes? Are they are they even contemplating this at this point? Because obviously you got 
literally thousands of building codes in different parts. And is there something we can do to kind of encourage them to be looking at this? Uh, yes, uh, so the International Code Council did respond to the recommendation and they are considering, uh, they're looking after the development of the NFPA standard to see how it could be referenced in the building codes. But um, when we met with them early on, uh, both NFPA and I, uh, ICC, they, they mentioned that the fuel gas codes would be the most appropriate place uh, just because it oversees the gas piping in the in the home. And so you would want that alarm uh, to be located near the, the piping itself. And so that's, that's the response we received. But uh, it is being considered uh, also for the building codes. Yeah, well, this, this seems like something that we should uh, really be uh, pushing on. Um, I want to follow up a little bit on uh, Member Chapman's uh, third party um, damage uh, control. And I guess a, a question, if somebody damage, is, is there any training required uh, for somebody operating a backhoe or can you just go rent one and, and even though you call 811, you can start digging? Mr. Hall, can you answer that? Sorry about that. Uh, that's going to vary state by state with the licensing requirements for excavators. Uh, but there are a set of what I would call best practices. Uh, and the, the rules also specify that uh, you can only do hand digging within 18 inches. Uh, one of the best practices is actually vacuum excavation, where you essentially use a large vacuum cleaner to suck the dirt out around the pipe. Uh, there's there's a number of practices, and as I mentioned earlier, that's something uh, we've been looking at in our San Francisco investigation, uh, which should be wrapping up uh, here shortly this year. Now the uh, the vacuum uh, extraction is interesting, but I think you'd have to, in a lot of cases, have to loosen the dirt up first, wouldn't you, in order to uh, get any satisfaction from that? Oh, possibly, yes, by hand. Okay, well. Uh, I'm out of time here, so I'll stop. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hall. And yeah, Member Homedy, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chairman. Member Homedy, you're next. Thank you, and this time I have my timer. Um, I want to go back to integrity management, and I just, uh, you know, it really, I guess it, it still bothers me that there were a number of leaks that the company just replaced the pipeline and didn't look at the cause of the failure. I, I do think that really is a detriment to safety, but also what they could know for the integri their integrity management program. Um, you know, it's not often where you dig up a pipeline and you are able to look at uh, leaks or potential failures and in the gas piping uh, technology committee guidance it actually says situations in which buried pipe must be exposed for maintenance or other purposes like a, a leak present an opportunity to collect data about the pipe and its environment at very little or no additional cost and you know that's key to a key to managing uh, the integrity of your pipeline is knowing uh, what causes failure and what causes what caused leaks on your system. I note that between and Ms. Mr. Hall or Ms. Lyons, if you can pull up your camera for a sec, I note I note that between February 23rd and March 31st. Atmos found 741 grade one and grade two leaks in Northwest Dallas. Uh, uh, how, how many of those do we know? Did they look at the cause of the leaks for those or just did, did they replace pipe or maybe we don't know? Yeah, they reported to the Railroad Commission um, that they excavated um, 703, so a majority of those. Okay, okay, good. All right, so they did, they excavated, but they looked at the cause. That's right. Mm -hmm. And how about in this neighborhood, though? They looked at a portion of them, 
and not another portion of them I read. Yeah, if I remember correctly, they um, there were the 26 leaks and then they looked at 15 of them. Mm -hmm. Identify the cause. OK, well, I think I, you know, I, I would think you want to, you would want to look at all of them. Um, one one uh, one area I want to highlight as part of integrity management is threats to your to your pipeline. Once you, you know, you, you have to know your pipeline, federal regulations require that you know, th that you identify threats to your pipeline system. And federal regulations lay out uh, eight or so areas uh, of, of potential threats, but it's, it's not just your existing threats, correct? It's also potential threats to your system. That's correct. Okay. And so in looking at some of the threats, uh, you would maybe, would you want to consider weather? Yes. Would you want to consider excavation damage? Yes. In fact, PHMSA's, uh, uh, some of their guidance says uh, you would want to consider a release or failure determined to have resulted from previous damage due to excavation activity. Uh, would you want to look at uh, gas migration. I mean, is that a new phenomenon in, for gas companies or something they should be looking at? Yeah, that's something that they they do um, include as part of their risk model. Mm -hmm. And uh, should you be looking at earth movement? Yes. Okay. And that brings me, uh, in, in fact, and, and let me just point out, not just in federal regulations, but the Railroad Commission's regulations have that uh, the pipeline companies have to look at environmental factors that affect gas migration, include conditions that could increase the potential for leak, uh, uh, that could create a hazard such as weather conditions, including significant amounts of rainfall. So I just point that out. But uh, along the lines of I, I, I do want to talk about the BCI um, uh, report that Atmos uh, uh, hired BCI to do, but I'm running out of time, so I'm going to come back and do that in the next round. Okay, very well. Thank you. I've got questions along that line, too, so I'm glad you're going to ask about that. Member Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to go back to the uh, um, measuring devices uh, for this round and continue where I left off. Can uh, somebody explain to me uh, how you use the bar hold tester and specifically how long it's supposed to be held in the ground and uh, how that survey is supposed to be done and tested along uh, maybe the piping lines uh, or along the pipeline? Sure, yeah, the material from the vendor indicates that um, the um, sorry, I'll start from the beginning. The, they first make a hole in the ground that might be like two to three feet deep approximately. Um, and then they would, it, it varies though. And then they would um, insert a tube into that hole that would um, draw air into their measurement device. Their measurement device has a sensor on it that will not indicate whether there is gas present or not. Typically for the bar hole test, the vendor material indicates that the standard time for that test is 45 seconds. Okay, so basically we're trying to draw air, air out of a hole that's filled with water in most cases in, in, with the, uh, the uh, testing that they were doing at the time after the first two incidents. Right, well, they couldn't do that, so that's why they, they couldn't do that, it. yeah. So they had severe restrictions in that case with the bar hold. Thank you. And then we did note that the uh, uh, remote methane leak detector, the RMLD, uh, had some limitations with uh, with water, heavier rain. And a matter of fact, uh, but I, the survey specialist, especially survey specialist A, uh, described it uh, as the RMLD as the only piece of equipment that he had that he could survey in the rain. So um, I think he also quoted that he got one solid indication all the way down, unquote, the alley bordering Durango Drive and Española Drive in his testimony. Did the uh, survey specialist report this indication to the supervisor? He did. 
And what did the supervisor say about it? Um, he walked around the area with him and um, they, I think they had a solid indication the whole time so they didn't have an actionable leak that they could take action on. He thought it was a false positive. Thought it was false positive and I think he also stated that other tech, te technicians had performed bar hole testing in the area in question they didn't detect any gas. That's right. He, even though we knew that wasn't accurate also and also holding that above the ground is not really the way to perform the test. Is that correct? That's correct. OK, so as we've discussed here, uh, we have excess water that's prevented our tech the technicians from following standard bar hole testing procedures, leading technicians to survey gas readings above ground. Thus, the technoc technicians couldn't reliably or accurately read subsurface gas levels in this case. So despite significant limitations to the gas detection, uh, how many leaks did Atmos find prior to the uh, the uh, the explosion, the uh, the third explosion? Yeah, between the second incident and the explosion, they found 13 grade one and two leaks. 13, 13 grade one and two. As a matter of fact, within, that was within about an eight block section, if I remember right. Uh, so, so here we had yeah 13, we had two explosion, 13 leaks, four grade one, which represent an existing or probable hazard to persons or property that required immediate repair. We had indications of gas down the alley near the main because that's where the main is, is down the alley. And we had inability to accurately test for subsurface gas indications. So at that point, I don't understand why Atmos didn't shut off the gas. I just, I don't get it. Um, I know it's easy to be uh, what I call an armchair quarterback after the fact, but um, I've always taken the most conservative route in my operations and it sure seems like they should have shut it down to try to figure out what was going on before they allowed anything else to happen. So I see my time is up and uh, that is all the questions I have, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Member Graham, thank you very much. Uh, Member Chapman, I, I understand you don't have any questions at this time. So uh, if that's still the case, then I will I will proceed with my questions. Yeah, so let me ask you this. So um, Member Graham was on a good line of questioning that if they were to shut down the pipeline, then 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 we know that there would be complications with bringing it back up again. But for for the amount of pipeline that would be shut down, how many pilot lights, how many homes would they have to come back in and, and relight the pilot lights for? If they just shut down the alley, it would be 25. OK, thank you. Um, so not, yes, consequential, but not in the case of uh, in the case of San Bruno, they were literally if they shut off the peninsula in that particular thing, it would have been hundreds of thousands of of homes and also in this case it wouldn't have been horribly consequential but the downside of not doing it turned out to be deadly um so so in the um between between march 1st i'm sorry between the day of the uh, the, the explosion on february the 23rd and the end of march Altogether, Atmos identified 1,265 leaks that were both grade one and grade two. And as Member Hamidi pointed out, 741 of those were in the northwest uh, Dallas in the vicinity of where the uh, explosion and the fires occurred. Um, here's what I want to here's what I want to to ask. So we've got the the fires. We can't absolutely say that the fires, the two fires, were related to this half inch, I'm sorry, to this uh, this gas main leak in the alleyway. I think that's what I heard uh, Miss McAtee say. But is that correct? That is correct, only because there we, were other locations. As yeah, well. thank you. But we we do believe with a high degree of likelihood or probability that that half inch, I'm sorry, that that two inch gas main uh, in the alleyway is what led to the explosion at 3534 Española. I believe that's correct. 
That's correct. So separate and apart from that, we've got the issue of all of these other leaks, which I think we're saying uh, could be due to the high plasticity clay soils uh, that would have led to the high number of leaks there. Is that is that correct? So as far as the cause of the additional leaks, um, we didn't determine that. Atmos determined them and reported it to the Railroad Commission, and, and they're not reported based on the clay soil. But the clay soil is one important and significant degradation mechanism that could have led to m many of them. Is it true that that in your opinion, the connection between all of those other leaks, those 1,265 leaks, and this, this explosion is the lack of an effective integrity management system of Atmos Energy. Our, our team believe that um, the issues with the integrity management program were not directly linked to the explosion because the um, damage, that one crack in the main was caused by um, latent failure from excavation damage that I would not have expected them to be able to predict accurately the location and their risk model for their dump program. Okay, thank you. Um, Let me let me ask this to Mr. Zakar. Well, really, I just see the hand raised here. I didn't start my clock either, but uh, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll wait and come back for another round. And uh, Mr. Zakar, you'll be next when I come back. Um, Vice Chairman, I, do you have questions at this point, sir? No further questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Member Hamandi, I recognize you for 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Lyons, can I follow up on something you just said on the integrity management program? Putting aside the explosion, looking at the tremendous number of leaks that were identified on the Atmos's system following the night before the explosion and then following the explosion, do you believe those are uh, are the uh, results of an inadequate integrity management program? Yeah, I believe the number of leaks that they found and based on the causes that Atmos identified and the circumstances that we discovered in this investigation to be uh, an indication of integrity management deficiencies. Okay, thank you. And I do want to go back um, to integrity management for a second, but I want to ask about the BCI report and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers report that that we had we worked with the Army Corps of Engineers on. At most hired BCI, which suggested in a report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hall. That movement of two formations in historic rain quote unquote, caused longitudinal forces to be added to the system that could not have readily uh, been readily detected, predicted, anticipated, or foreseen. What's your response to the BCI re report and, and that statement? Well, when I saw that report, uh, I, it raised a lot of questions for me. You know, why do you have something that you couldn't predict? You know, the geology has been that way for thousands and perhaps millions of years, and, and you're saying you can't predict it. Uh, and it prompted us to uh, reach out to the Corps of Engineers and contract with them to do a study on the validity of the BCI report. Uh, and the results of their study uh, did not support the results of the Corps of Engineers did not support what BCI was saying in the area of the accident. Uh, further, we we did other research. Uh, we looked at, we got a hold of our meteorologist and looked at the historic rainfall and found out that the rainfall that occurred over those three days was not truly historic. It was a record for February, but 
I believe it ranked 28th on the list of three-day rainfalls for that particular area of Dallas. Uh, so, you know, the, the rain was a predictable thing. Uh, we looked into the soil from the, the uh, Corps of Engineers. They identified the clay soils. We identified that in our report on the Richland Hills. Uh, this was all predictable, should have been part of the integrity management program. Uh, it and it wasn't, it may have been sudden and unexpected to Dallas or to the Atmos because they probably weren't looking for it, but it should have been part of their program. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think, I think on this one, you know, my reaction to the BCI report when I read it was the same as yours in that even if we disagreed with what BCI came up with, if if they say there are two formations and 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 rain, that's something that that doesn't just automatically appear. That's something that should have been taken into account as part of their integrity management program. And then when they do their risk analysis, that should be considered. And you know, I mean, sometimes, and FIMSA has pointed this out many times that you might have something that is seemingly low risk, but uh, has catastrophic consequences. And in this situation, there were, there were a number of threats that were pointing at uh, some things that Atmos should have done. And I will point out that in this situation, the risk was considerable, not just for this community, but if you look at the 258 counties listed in, in, in Atmos's integrity management plan, 254 counties in Texas, Dallas County has the highest uh, people per square mile of land. And so you would think that uh, more uh, they would have put together a good plan and a good program, but uh, there were definitely deficiencies here, and I think that's unfortunate. Um, I do have some questions on uh, reporting, and so I don't know who that is, if it's Miss Lyons or if it's somebody else, if you could, um, on reporting. So here you have this, I want to go back to the night of February 22nd, or the day. So you have a, a second incident that occurs. You have uh, other people had reported uh, some gas issues uh, in, in those two incidents to the arson investigators. Uh, you have a Atmos technician that called in other people. We counted 12, Atmos says 25. Regardless, you have a number of people on scene. They're finding leaks. They are repairing leaks. You have grade one leaks that uh, require prompt action to protect life and property. And somewhere at 6.53 p.m. Thursday, Atmos sends an email to the Railroad Commission that says the following. We have responded to two separate leak investigations when fires within these homes had occurred. Do you think it's interesting that they now call it fire, but at the time they emailed and said two, two leak investigations? Yeah. yeah. So you have two leak investigations. Based on the information we have at this time, we believed measured gas was potentially a factor in both. As an enhanced measure, Atmos crews are continuing to monitor the surrounding area. And this was something that uh, Texas asked for. It's called a courtesy notification. But at this point, they've stated, we think there's a leak. They have two people who went to the hospital, uh, one who was in, who, who, who uh, at least had very significant, you know, some serious burns. And it, to me, that requires reporting to the NRC. If you know there's a leak, you state there's a leak, 
and you think there might be a leak because it doesn't have to be completely confirmed, but or or the source, but you you they've stated we believe measured gas was potentially a factor. At that point, should they been uh, notifying? I think by measured gas, they're indicating that they believe the leak is downstream of the meter, so it would be non-jurisdictional, and my understanding is it would not have required reporting. Do you know if um, uh, cur the courtesy notification, uh, uh, they the, the state had asked, were there injuries and fatalities? Do you know if they responded? I didn't see a response in our docket. That's why I'm asking. Oh. So after I did reach out to the Railroad Commission about the response, I don't recall right now. I, I do remember that the response didn't come until after the explosion um, the following morning. So okay. all indications seem that they didn't actually receive that because it didn't go through official channels and their on-call staff was not notified through the you know way that would require them to respond immediately. So here we have some a company that says we have two separate leak investigations where fires were within the homes. They talk about we believe measured gas was potentially a factor. So at that point you have, so the first night or the first day you have uh, a situation where they did not detect a leak. The second one, they said, oh, we might have a problem. We don't think even though the first night occurred, we should have been reporting. They should have been reporting. The, in the regulation on the team's read of the regulation, the only way they would get a report is if it was considered to be significant in the judgment of the operator. And, you know, a lot of operators would have considered those two incidents significant even just one. I mean, when we're when I'm serving as duty officer, I often get gas company reports that say this is a potential release and they they may find out later that it's not jurisdictional and pull it back. But my understanding is they're not required to submit that unless it's significant in their own judgment. But it, but significant in their own judgment is linked to there being a leak in that definition, a leak in and then significant judgment in the regulations. No, it's it's um let me just make sure before I answer you. Yeah, so it's it's not related to the leak. So um, related to the leak from their pipeline are the consequence criteria. Um, and then separate from that, an incident would also include an event that's significant in the direct in the judgment of the operator. Well, actually, the, the, okay, but an event that involved a release of gas, that's the first part of the requirement. Yes. An event that re involved a release of gas, that's the first part of the reporting requirement. Yeah, so it, so if it meets the definition of a, an incident, it would hit their, their immediate notification. Incident means any of the following events. There's three. Number one involves a leak from their pipeline and consequence criteria. Number two is not related to gas distribution in the system. And number three is an event that's significant in the judgment of the operator. Right. And, and you know, and I do want to talk about that because um, I do, I, we will come back and probably talk about that when we get to the findings, because that's what I want to understand more. Um, that's all I have for now, and I will have some questions when we get to that, if that's okay. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, seeing no no uh, further questions from my colleagues at this point, I'm going to uh, I will go ahead uh, with some questions, and if anybody has questions, uh, just just let me know. Um, so, question that I was going to ask. Well, I'll tell you what. Let me let me. Uh, let me continue along the line that Member Hamadi was asking about the geological factors. Um, were there were there any other abnormally high number of underground utility un, uh, infrastructure that was having failures? For example, I would imagine if you were having geological shifting, you might have had some some sewer lines or something that would have been uh, disjointed or anything. And I see that uh, Mr. Hall has turned his his camera on. 
Go ahead, sir. Yeah, when we got the BCI letter, uh, that's one of the questions we asked. We reached out to the city of Dallas and said, are there issues with the water system? Are there issues with the sewer system? Because you would expect if that was such a big issue that those two systems would be affected as well. And their, their answer was no. Okay. <laughs> they Thank weren't you. experiencing any abnormal increase in failures. Thank you. So I do want to I do want to reemphasize what what member Hamidi said is that even though sink and swell or, or swell and, and shrink of ground is a known phenomena with these types of soil conditions, Atmos Energy's integrity management system should have identified that as a threat. And that's all I think I'll say on on that. But I do believe that that's what that's what an IM system is for is to identify threats to your system and then take actions to minimize the uh, the the likelihood and severity and uh, probability of those events uh, occurring. Dr. Jenner, um, we've not heard from you today. I understand that that you have some things you'd like to say about confirmation bias as it relates to to this event. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, earlier discussion suggested how the technicians beliefs about the cause of the house incidents may have been influenced, may have influenced the ar arson investigators initial assessment. So staff considered the confirmation bias and um, that is the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing beliefs. And that affects how we gather information and influences how we interpret information. So for instance, we have initially an arson investigator telling Atmos technicians that the source of the leak was inside the house. Uh, then we have a number of negative bar hole readings along the main um, that led them to believe that the source, that, that was not the source outside, uh, despite the limitations of their equipment. And later we have uh, pos uh, positive readings from equipment um, in the alley, but that was discounted as being a false positive. So ultimately the evidence that was collected confirmed their initial belief that the problem was likely inside the houses. But as we have discussed, additional information was required to accurately determine the actual source of uh, the leak being outside. Well, thank you. And given that we're all susceptible to confirmation bias, um, how do we guard against that? Uh, that uh, trust but verify, <laughs> if I may uh, uh, borrow a phrase. Um, we, we need to continue to uh, challenge um, and, and, and think bigger than just the information we have, we have to think about the information that we don't have. And uh, I, I think the information that we don't have in, in here included, um, you know, what was uh, the crawl spaces under the houses, testing and internal piping inside the houses and the appliances um, and limitations of the equipment. So we, ask, we have to ask ourselves, is the, the data that is not available to us, could that be uh, the answer that we're looking for? So we can't discount that. Thank you, Dr. Jenner. It's good to see you after a long time of having not seen you, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Zaykar, this is a question I was going to ask you uh, and then, uh, then I ran out of time. But uh, considering that the sanitary sewer line was installed in 1995, and supposedly that's when, when it was struck by the backhoe. Uh, why did it take so long for this crack to propagate, to, to this damage to propagate to a crack? And, and talk about that, if you will. Uh, yes, uh, well, the, the, the fracture occurred in several phases. It's, it's not just one event. It's, it started when the dent first occurred. The dent introduced a, a small minute cracks into the bottom of the dent, which you know, extended about 0.07 inches deep. Uh, and then it, it just basically uh, arrested there for a while. Now we have another mechanism which was introduced uh, in cathodic protection system. We have uh, 
uh, hydrogen evolution, which embrittles the pipe. So any propagation after that uh, later would be from hydrogen induced cracking. Now the hydrogen induced cracking itself will not cause the pipe to, to crack. There has to be some external force. Um, you know, some of the possible uh, forces are from uh, swelling of the soil or residual stresses within the pipe. You know, pipes are connected to each other and they push one another. So those could be some sources, but the exact source uh, cannot be uh, determined. Uh, and, and eventually uh, the pipe uh, broke and, and, and gave way, but because of the, the uh, amount of oxidation, oxidation uh, moderate corrosion, calcareous deposit and pitting, we, we pretty much feel that it's not a recent fracture. If it was, it would have been a, a clean fracture with no oxidation. That would have meant a recent fracture, but because of the moderate amount of corrosion we found, it would, been, would have been there you know, at least three days but getting beyond that point, it's difficult to actually uh, uh, give it a time period. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I want to follow up on what the vice chairman was talking about that, and, and that is methane detectors. In the draft report, we say, had an effective methane detector been installed in the house at 3534 Espanola Drive, the residents would likely have been alerted to the dangerous levels of gas before the explosion occurred. And when I read that, I certainly am not blaming the residents of that house for not having a methane de detector. In fact, I don't have one, uh, but as soon as the doorbell rings and Amazon delivers it, uh, I will. Because as I was going through this report for the final time over the weekend, I thought I've got gas in my house and I don't have a methane detector. So at that point, I went to a, a largely used uh, vendor on the internet and, uh, and ordered one and it should be here today. So I think that's not something that a lot of us think about. Certainly I have smoke detectors, there's one right there, but have not thought about a methane detector. So uh, that is important, we go back to recommendations going back to 1976, 45 years ago, where we had our first recommendations for methane detectors. And today, uh, I think we will reiterate three recommendations that we issued recently for methane detectors. So I think that's an important factor. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments before we go to the findings? Uh, I do have some follow-up questions on reporting. Sure, absolutely. Oh, okay. I, I do want to try to understand this. Um, Ms. Lyons, if, if you don't mind uh, turning on your camera, because I, I have been a big advocate for more reporting, especially on pipeline incidents, going back to when I was in Marshall after the Marshall uh, pipeline rupture and just seeing what occurred there and uh, also in San Bruno and other places. So I'm definitely a strong advocate for more reporting. I think where I get concerned is that we would have uh, too much reporting of uh, incidents before we actually know there's an incident. And, you know, I, I think that that's what I'm trying to figure out. In, in Under federal regulations, it says at the earliest practical moment, a practicable moment following discovery, but no later than one hour after confirmed discovery, each operator must give notice uh, in accordance with paragraph B of the section of each incident. It defines confirmed discovery of uh, when it can be reasonably determined based on information available to the operator at the time a reportable event has occurred, even if only based on a preliminary evaluation. Uh, and then it goes on to define incidents in three areas, which you mentioned includes an event that is significant in the judgment of the operator. I do believe 
that statement alone leaves a lot of discretion to the operator, for sure. I, what I'm having trouble with, and I know you pointed me to Minnesota and some others, but what I'm having trouble with is what happened on that first, the first incident, which we've, we, which you, you've said is related with what they knew. Granted, I believe they didn't do what they needed to do on scene. Had they done it, they would have identified there was a leak which would have been reportable because somebody went to the hospital. So on that night, with what they knew, how would reporting have been any different? Because I see the problem as the leak detection problem and the follow-up and the failure to monitor for gas. So if they had reported the leak, like near the time that they were called on scene, near the time they found out that it was both gas related. Um, and, you know, I guess it's debatable to them at the time whether it was a fire or explosion, but something significant happened at that first property that was gas related. If they were required to report that through official channels um, within an hour of that initial notification, right, the tech getting there, then that would have alerted the Railroad Commission FIMSA and NTSB all at the same time, essentially the same time. So the Railroad Commission, I would expect, would follow up directly with them. FIMSA and the NTSB may have been in like a monitoring mode, but would have been aware. When the second incident occurred, you know, we typically have duty officers for like a week at a time. So the person would have noticed, otherwise it was their colleague, that, like you would have known that something just happened yesterday and basically the same location was the same company. That would have flagged something to not only us, but also to FEMSA's Accident Investigation Division that something is happening here. The Railroad Commission probably would have already had people on site and I believe that they would have been required to do um, more than they did. And you say the Railroad Commission would have probably been on site because on the second night they were they were given a courtesy notification, but you say that because they would have known about the first incident the day before. So they were given the courtesy notification by email and as far as I could tell, and we did look, they did not uh, re like receive that. They didn't check their email that night. They weren't, you know, they weren't on call. They didn't receive that until the explosion occurred and then the National Response Center notification came out and the NTSB, FEMSA and the Railroad Commission were all aware the Railroad Commission was on site very quickly. And and I think, I, I understand what you're saying. I just think, here, here's where I'm at on this. And we've actually weighed in on it on the past with, it, uh, in a 2015 rulemaking where we weighed in on uh, uh, the definition of confirmed discovery, where we said we didn't want it to say may have been a reportable event uh, at the time. And so uh, what I'm trying to prevent is you have tens of thousands of pipeline reports coming into the NRC. You have 1.3 million miles of gas distribution pipeline, 13 and 30, 1,338 that just distribution operators and 2 million structure fires a year that uh, firefighters respond to. And, you know, I, I, I don't want a situation where if they don't, in this situation, they didn't even recognize there was a leak that first night. So are we saying, even if you think there might have been, you should call in that first night? I mean, I think the information they had available while inaccurate was still inaccurate and not enough for that. Yeah, I mean, I think that had they reported, it would have made a difference in what they did. So we were attempting to come up with a way that that information would have got to the people who need it. This is one way. Perhaps there's work that needs to be done on exactly um, which events, like potentially gas-related events that have maybe a different set of consequences than what PIMSA has for all their incidents. There might be some more 
thought needed there, research on that topic. But yeah, getting I, I, the notification. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying there should be, I'm definitely an advocate, like I said, advocate for, for more reporting. I just don't want it to become a situation where you have unintended consequences of reporting of things that are not gas related and or liquid related. And uh, in this situation, I do believe that in the judgment of the operators too much, but in the absence of a leak that they fa they failed to recognize that, that's the real issue. I think even if you had reporting of unintentional fire or explosion uh, uh, requirement in NRC, I think they still wouldn't have reported because they didn't think it was a gas related fire. They, they still think it's a structure fire. They're calling it a structure fire, but they did recognize that it was a gas involved event. And that's different from just a plain structure fire. I mean, they knew that something had happened at the HVAC unit uh, that caused the, that that was the initiating event or, or perhaps the ignition source. Uh, you know, I used to long time ago work at FEMSA and I took the calls and we got lots of calls for events that were potential events because the operator didn't know, but they wanted to call to make sure that on the back end, they didn't get hit for not reporting. Uh, one of the things that we've seen over the years is actually uh, events that are gas related, but not utility uh, leaks, but, but house leaks and appliance problems have actually been on the decline as the technology has improved, as we've gotten rid of standing pilots, as as uh, you know, the new appliances are much safer than the old appliances. I just I don't personally see that it would be an overwhelming issue uh, at FEMSA or at the Railroad Commission or at the other state to get potentially uh, related incidents. You know, the the other thing I keep coming back to is you know, immediately, there are those of us in the industry that have been around a while, immediately when we heard that it was two houses on the same street, it's like, it's, 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 it's most likely, highly probable, more than 99% related to the Atmos system. Uh, because, you know, they just don't happen very often. And the ones that happen, we've investigated and we find out it's, it's a system problem. Okay, when we get to re one of the recommendations, I'm going to ask you to uh, talk about a little bit more about how uh, how you see that for um, implementation, how, how you envision that should be implemented. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. We're going to take a break in just a moment, but uh, do before we do that, do any of my colleagues have uh, any follow up questions? Okay, seeing none, what we're going to do now is um, we are going to take a break and give people enough time to get a bite to eat. Um, before we break, I'd like to invite everyone to turn their cameras and their mics off. Uh, we're going to break until 1.30, which will be about 42 minutes from now. And um, we could say one. 20. Let's do 120. We're going to take a break until 120 East Coast time and we are in recess.
Good afternoon. We are back in session. I'd like to make a quick announcement before we uh, begin. I understand that there were some technical difficulties with some people being able to receive uh, the webcast. And I want to remind you that the webcast will be archived and available for playback in entirety in case you missed any of it. Uh, we don't believe many people missed it, but there were some occasional uh, outages in certain areas. With that, um, do any of my colleagues have any questions before we proceed to reading the findings? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Bryson, would you please read the proposed findings? Yes, sir. As a result of this investigation, staff proposes 22 findings. Number one, none of the following were factors in the explosion. One, ongoing maintenance activities. Two, overpressurization of the gas distribution system. Three, materials used for the construction of the gas main and external coating. And four, natural gas composition. Number two, the natural gas main was damaged by mechanical excavation equipment, likely when the sanitary sewer lateral was replaced in 1995. Number three, the cir circumferential crack in the main propagated through the pipe wall prior to the first incident, allowing natural gas to leak into the surrounding environment for an extended period of time. Number four, Soil absorbed and depleted the natural gas odorant, eliminating the opportunity for occupants to detect it. Number five, natural gas leaking from Atmos Energy Corporation's cracked gas main in the alley behind 3534 Espinola Drive migrated through the soil and into the house where it was in ignited by an unknown source. Number six, Dallas Fire Rescue Department's initial misclassification of the first incident delayed the sharing of information that could have helped Atmos Energy Corporation identify the or origin of the leak. Number seven, had the Dallas Fire Rescue Department's arson investigators been adequately trained on natural gas systems, their investigation findings would have provided more timely and accurate assistance to Atmos Energy Corporation in locating the source of the gas leak. Number eight, timely pressure testing of the customer piping could have eliminated potential sources of the gas leaks and helped Atmos Energy Corporation to focus on outside leak detection efforts to locate the damaged and leaking gas system piping more quickly. Number nine, Atmos Energy Corporation did not adequately investigate the first two gas-related incidents that occur occurred at 3527 and 3515 Durango Drive. Number 10, damage to the structure involved in the first incident on 3527 Durango Drive was consistent with a fuel gas air mixture explosion which was most likely caused by natural gas that migrated from underneath the structure. Number 11, fuel gas was involved in both incident homes. There was insufficient evidence to exclude natural gas from Atmos Energy Corporation's system from either incident. Evidence of leaks prior, present prior to the first two incidents occurring and the probability of two or three structure fire slash explosions occurring independently on the same block during the same week is very low. Therefore, the two prior incidents that occurred on the same block on subsequent days and the explosion of 3534 Espinola Drive were all likely related. Number 12, limitations of the equipment and procedures due to the wet weather conditions on the ability of Atmos Energy Corporation to reliably detect the presence of leaked gas during its response to the first two incidents should have prompted Atmos Energy Corporation to shut down the pipeline operations. Number 13, had Atmos Energy Corporation pressure, pressure tested the main in the alley behind the first two incident homes on February 21st or 22nd, 
it could have found that the main did not hold pressure, spurring additional protective actions that could have prevented the fatal injury at 3534 Espinola Drive. Number 14, Atmos Energy Corporation's wet weather leak investigations procedures were insufficient given the known limitations of its equipment. Number 15, the assistance of the Dallas Fire Rescue Department's hazardous materials response team, particularly after the second incident, could have enhanced Atmos Energy Corporation's leak investigation. Number 16, had methane detectors been installed at the residences located on Durango and Espinola Drives, an alarm would have alerted residents to a gas release reducing the potential for and consequence of the resulting natural gas fires and explosions. Number 17, the lack of official reporting of the first two incidents by Atmos Energy Corporation delayed the response from regulatory authorities, the Railroad Commission of Texas, and the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. Number 18, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration does not provide clear requirements regarding the level of investigation necessary to determine whether an event is subject to its reporting requirements, potentially resulting in the underreporting of natural gas incidents. Number 19, if Dallas Fire Rescue Department reported the first two incidents in a timely manner, it could have prompted further investigation or regulatory oversight prior to the explosion. Number 20, the high number of leaks observed in Northwest Dallas after the explosion were due to the degradation of Atmos Energy Corporation's gas distribution system, not sudden unanticipated geologic loadings. Number 21, the methodology employed in Atmos Energy Corporation's gas distribution integrity management program was generally consistent with industry guidance and pipeline and hazardous materials safety administration expectations, but did not adequately consider threats that were degrading its pipeline system. The likelihood of failure associated with these threats or the potential consequences of such a failure. Number 22. While Atmos Energy Corporation's periodic leak survey methodology and frequency complied with the minimum state and federal requirements, it was not able to identify the degraded system that was found after the explosion. Ms. Bryson, thank you very much for reading those. Uh, at this time, we will do a roll call to ensure that uh, we are prepared to deliberate. Vice Chairman Landsberg. I am prepared to deliberate, sir. Thank you. Member Hamidi. I am here. Thank you. Very good. Member Graham. Member Graham's ready to deliberate. All right, sir. And Member Chapman. Present, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Okay. Uh, I understand there's some amendments uh, offered by uh, Member Hamidi. Are there any other proposed amendments at this time? Okay, um, certainly we can offer amendments uh, throughout the process, but uh, since Member Homedy has already uh, filed some, uh, we will go ahead and begin with her. So, Member Homedy, you are recognized. Um, thank you. Uh, my first amendment would strike finding six, which currently states Dallas Fire Rescue Department's initial misclassification of the first incident delayed the sharing of information that could have helped Atmos Energy Corporation identify the origin of the leak. Okay, that's Member Hamidi's motion. Is there a second? Second for discussion. All right, Member Graham has seconded for discussion. Member Hamidi. Yes. Uh, with this one, um, Dallas Fire Rescue came to the scene after a structure fire was reported. And in accordance with their standard operating procedure for structure fires, they turned off the gas and called Atmos, which came to the scene. Uh, at some point, the arson investigator 
uh, came to the house. Actually, I guess there was two, one inside, one outside. There were some interviews and uh, there was uh, some miscommunication between the interview of the 15 year old son and the arson investigator that unfortunately are not reflected in the report uh, where the arson investigator uh, uh, was led to believe that there was a gas heater in the home. Uh, that was not the case. There was a misunderstanding because of a language barrier and the homeowner had already gone to the hospital at that point. And uh, later it was determined, not until March 2nd, that it was the HVAC system. So at the time, I do feel uh, although gas monitoring could have occurred, the initial misclassification was the re was uh, partially the result of uh, information and a mis uh, inaccurate information based on a miscommunication. Further, I do not believe any actions of, of Dallas Fire should have influenced Atmos's decision to look for a lease. Although procedure does not state that Atmos should return, it should have stated, and Atmos should have come back to the scene, monitored for gas, looked more for leaks, and they failed to do so. And I think finding six leads the reader to believe that uh, a, a lot is on Dallas uh, in that finding, Dallas fire, more so than Atmos. Thank you very much. Um discussion amongst my colleagues before we turn to the staff. Well, I got a question, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and for uh, Member Homendy. Um, do you believe that the uh, arson investigators have a responsibility to go beyond uh, just a witness statement uh, where they don't fully understand what's happening? Um, I, I do, but uh, as in with most structure fires and explosions, they, this is a preliminary report and it changes over time based on the information. In fact, as I pointed out, we also didn't see the first two incidents as related. When we first arrived on scene, that changed over time. When I talked to the chief of that division, that arson division, it takes time to finish a report. This was a preliminary report. But when it comes to Atmos, it's Atmos's responsibility to determine the leak and to uh, ensure the integrity of their pipeline. But don't you think uh, that as an arson investigator that you should spend a little more time looking and judging by the conditions of the, uh, the the property, it would seem like there should have been a little more uh, in-depth uh, look at this. And you know, obviously, we did have a miscommunication here. There's no no question about that. Uh, and I don't know that this is necessarily laying blame. I mean, in the next finding, we talk about the the fact uh, of of additional training being required. But um, I'm I'm still a little. Um, uncertain about this one. So I'll, I'll stop here and go into listen mode. No, I understand that. But in this situation, you had a key witness who wasn't even present at the time. And that had to occur and needed time. So I do think this, you know, regardless of whether Dallas and this is on their initial misclassification, that's what the onerous is here. Uh, uh, it was up to Atmos to determine whether there was a leak on the pipeline. Yeah, uh, Member Homedy, I don't doubt that it's up to Atmos to uh, to make that that determination. However, I do believe it's factual. I do I believe this is a factual statement that the uh, that when this service technician was told that it was a, a, a house fire, something inside the house, I think as Dr. Jenner talked about, it was a confirmation bias whereby he he then assumed, okay, that's what it is. And I do think that that influenced the decisions that were made after that. I don't necessarily see this as a, as a statement of culpability on the DFR's department. I see it more as a, as a factual statement that the initial misclassification delayed the sharing of information that could have been helpful to Atmos. 
uh, further comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have to say I'm somewhat torn because I think Member Hamidi makes uh, makes a good point. Um, I I'm in, I am inclined to think, though, that as you said, this is a this is a statement of fact with no you know no blame being offered here. It just this is what happened, and it resulted in a unfortunately a a, a failure to understand the seriousness of the situation. I, I I'll be interested to see. What the staff has to say about this, I, I am I am somewhat torn. Well, great, thank you. Um, I'd love to hear uh, what the staff says, and then we can come back to uh, my colleagues on the board. Mr. Hall, what I would love to hear staff's viewpoint. Uh, staff agrees with Member Hamandy that the primary responsibility is lays with Atmos as far as determining the source of the leak. And they didn't do that. Uh, and they should have done that in spite of whatever information the fire department passed on. They should have tested the internal piping. They should have tested the crawl space. Uh, and they didn't do those things. And uh, as a result, we, we uh, concur with her uh, desire to remove the finding. Well, Mr. Hall, thank you, and I appreciate that. If that's the case, why was it uh, in the draft report to begin with? Uh, in, in meetings with Member Hamidi, she made a very compelling argument. Uh, as she, as she usually does. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman, you have a comment. Yeah, um, I think, you know, I listen, I listen to this, and I don't see it as a statement of blame. I go along with you that this is a factual statement. And in fact, based on uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Jenner said, it did delay the sharing of some critical information. So um, I'm, again, we, I think we all agree that Atmos had, had uh, significant responsibility. This is just merely a statement of fact. Member Hamidi. I, I would just say, regardless, Initial misclassification is not accurate. In this situation, it was a classification of a uh, incident based on miscommunication between entities involved. Well, that 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 in itself would uh, would be a reasonable amendment to the existing finding six, but I think you want to uh, to strike it all together. Um, is there any any further discussion? Mr. Chairman, I, I think Mr. Hall's statement was definitive for me. I mean, it, it, it was up to Atmos to determine what was happening here. And the information they got from the fire department was certainly part of that equation, but they should have taken the steps necessary to determine the nature of of this incident. I don't I don't think it was entirely upon the fire department to do that. Well, thank you. I, I think that I think they were. If somebody tells you it's raining outside, before you look outside, you're going to um, you're going to put on a raincoat. You're going to assume that the information you were told was uh, was correct. And that's going to affect your your path moving forward until you can confirm it or deny it. Uh, otherwise, member Hamidi. Except in the transcript, it was probably. It wasn't a confirmation of absolutely. The words were, I think, probably. Thank you. Any further discussion before we move to the um, to the vote? Okay. So what we'll do is we'll we'll move to a roll call. And uh, it's been moved and seconded by Member Hamidi and seconded by Member Graham that we strike finding six in its entirety. We'll proceed to a roll call vote. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed will vote nay. Vice Chairman Landsberg, what is your vote? I'm going to vote nay, respectfully. Vice Chairman votes nay. Member Hamidi. Yay. Member Hamidi votes yay. Member Graham. Member Graham votes nay. Member Graham votes nay. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The chairman votes nay. The majority has it, so the motion fails. 
finding six um, will remain as finding six. Okay, Member Homedy, uh, and that was uh, okay. All right, yeah. so I have an amendment to finding seven. Okay. Finding seven says, had the Dallas Fire Rescue Department arson investigators been adequately trained on natural gas systems, their investigation findings would have provided more timely and accurate assistance to Atmos Energy Corporation in locating the source of the gas leak. My amendment would strike wood and insert may. All second. You're muted, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been moved by Member Homedy and seconded by Vice Chairman. Uh, and uh, Member Homedy, the floor is yours. If I push the right button, that would help. <laughs> um, uh, in reading, uh, I agree. Uh, I think more uh, training is needed. I think uh, you get a better result when anybody is trained more. Uh, but I just, I think Wood says uh, very affirmatively that um, something would happen based on training. And I think lots of other things could occur like missteps and not following appropriate procedures. So I just live, wanted to leave room for May. Great, thank you. I know you sent out these amendments uh, last night, but I'm, uh, give, give, give me, uh, if you will, just a, a moment to, uh, to read that. I'm going to go heads down and read it just for a second to myself. Thank you for indulging there. Um, discussion. Yeah, Member Graham. Yeah, I, I would support this uh, amendment. I, I think uh, we just don't know what they would have done with any of the information they had. Um, and we can't guarantee that they would have done something in any case. So I think May is a very appropriate in this case. Yeah, Likewise, I, Mr. Chairman. I think. OK, thank you. And. Uh, uh, staff, what are your thoughts? Uh, staff has no objection. Uh, we'll, we'll support the amendment. Thank you very much. Um, any further discussion? OK, uh, I'll, we'll move to a roll call vote. Uh, it's been moved and seconded that we strike wood, the word wood, and we replace with may. Um, Roll call vote. Uh, Vice Chairman Lansford. Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Homedy. Aye. Member Homedy votes aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The Chairman votes aye. The motion to amend finding seven has been approved unanimously. Member Homedy. Yep. Uh, finding eight uh, currently states timely pressure testing of the customer piping could have eliminated potential sources of the gas leaks and helped Atmos Energy Corporation focus on outside leak detection efforts to locate the damaged and leaking gas system piping more quickly. Uh, I, my amendment would just move uh, Atmos Energy Corporation earlier in that uh, uh, phrase, so it's clear that it's at most, we mean because of its location in the findings coming directly after Dallas Fire, that we don't mean Dallas Fire would be doing the pressure testing. This is at most energy doing the pressure testing. My amendment would then read, timely pressure testing of the customer piping by Atmos Energy Corporation could have eliminated potential sources of the gas leaks and helped focus their efforts on outside leak detection to locate the damaged and leaking gas system piping more quickly. Thank you very much. I'll give uh, all of us, including myself, just a moment to look that over one more time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, discussion amongst my colleagues. 
I think, I think did yes. I have a second? I'll second, I'll second. Mr. Chairman. I, I, I apologize for that. I, okay, so it's been moved by Member Hamadi and it was seconded by, I think the Vice Chairman is what I think I saw. So um, thank you for your motion. Uh, now time for discussion. Vice Chairman. Um, it looks reasonable to me. Thanks. Any other discussion before we go to staff? Michael Graham. I, I would support it. I'll support Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, staff, your thoughts? Uh, staff supports the amendment. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? It's been moved and seconded to amend finding eight as presented by member Hamadi. Vice Chairman Landsberg, your vote. Aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Hamadi. Aye. Member Hamadi votes aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The chairman votes aye. Finding number eight has been amended as proposed by Member Hamadi and seconded by the Vice Chairman. Member Hamadi. Thank you. Um, I have an amendment to finding 12. Finding 12 currently reads the limit limitations of the equipment and procedures due to the wet weather conditions on the ability of Atmos Energy Corporation to reliably detect the presence of leaked gas during its response to the first two incidents should have prompted Atmos Energy Corporation to shut down the pipeline operations. My amendment would read uh, limitations of the equipment and procedures due to the wet weather conditions on the ability of Atmos Energy Corporation to reliably detect the presence of leaked gas during its response to the first two incidents and the number and severity of leaks identified following the first two incidents should have prompted Atmos Energy Corporation to shut down or isolate the pipeline. You're, you're muted. muted, Mr. Chairman. Oh man. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's been moved. It's been moved by Member Hamadi to um, to adopt that uh, finding as presented. Is there a second? I'll second, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Member Chapman has seconded. Uh, discussion, please. Member Hamadi. Yeah, I think I think certainly the limitations on uh, equipment and procedures due to the wet weather condition should have also led should have led to uh, uh, them shutting down the pipeline. But also there were significant number and, and grade one four grade one leaks identified um, following the first two incidents that clearly should have triggered a shutdown or isolation. Okay, so you're adding and the number of and the number and severity of the leaks identified following the first two incidents. Yeah, okay. Very good. Um, any further any discussion amongst my colleagues? All right, I turn now to staff and uh, get the opinion of uh, the RPH staff. Uh, the only concern is that because the addition of the words say identified following, uh, they at one point did shut down and isolate the system. Uh, and really the, the point of the original was that they should have done it during the response to the first two incidents because that would have been before the third incident. So I think it loses that with the uh, additions. I don't disagree that the leaks, the grade one leaks uh, identified immediately following should have factored into their decision, but I want it to be clear that we meant a very quick shutdown, not the shutdown they eventually did. I see. I, again, I'd like a minute just to a moment just to read it carefully. Thank you. And then, and then uh, Member Homedy, I'll get you to follow up to that if you don't mind, but uh, I just want to read it carefully. Thanks. Uh, 
um, I, I hear what you're saying, Mr. Hall, um, and you're right, they did. Would adding a word to that word or two, would that help make the point that you're trying to make? Uh, yeah, I believe possibly we could add a word or two that would be uh, to uh, I'm at a loss for the right word right now. To shut down or isolate the pipeline before the explosion at 3534 Espanola occurred. But that's just, but but remember, Hamidi, it is your motion, and so uh, I, I turn back to you for for discussion at this point. Uh, yeah, I mean the original one didn't have that, but I'm not opposed to adding that. Personally, I, I do agree with your addition there, the blue addition there, and the number the number and severity of of leaks identified following the first two incidents. I mean, I think that yes, they should. Again, it's easy for, for us to be sitting right here to say, well, they could have, should have, would have. Uh, we, we have the ability to connect the dots because we know what happened. We have the hindsight bias. But you're right. Had they connected those dots and said, hey, this is a problem, then they could have shut down the system prior to uh, any further damage. In this case, the horrible accident that killed um, a 12-year-old girl and injured four others. So would you consider, Member Hamidi, adding something to the end of that uh, or somewhere in there to say, shut down the system or isolate the pipeline prior to? I, I have a suggestion, Chairman. Yes, please. If we say uh, where it says the number and severity of leaks identified following the first two incidents, if we said the number and severity of the leaks identified the day of the second incident. Uh, can I offer a suggestion? I think it's along the same lines, but maybe simpler. Um, the number and severity of leaks identified following the first two incidents and prior to the explosion. Well, Member Hamidi, it's up to you. This is your amendment. I mean, I'm fine with any of those. I mean, the or the simpler way is just saying and the number and severity of leaks identified and just dropping everything out and so that you have during its response to the first two incidents and the number and severity of leaks identified should have prompted Atmos Energy Corporation to shut down or isolate the pipeline. I think, though, that that does go back to member uh, back back to Mr. Hall's point is that yes, they did shut it down, but they but but they did it after 3534 Espanola uh, exploded, and uh, so I think that's what we're trying to get around at this point. Is that is that correct, Mr. Hall? We're yes, trying sir. To, okay. Yeah, I mean, any of that is fine. It wasn't in the original finding, so I mean. If yeah. you want to add prior to the ex ex explosion, I think that's fine. Well, in fact, I'm I'm in favor, first of all, of your adding the blue part. I also want to clarify what Mr. Hall is saying. And if we say prior to the explosion, well, it's really and have prevented the explosion because there would have been no explosion. So if we right. say prior to the explosion, we're saying prior to something that would not have have occurred. I know we're wordsmithing a little bit here, but um, would we consider taking five minutes to um, of a break just to come up with some language um, or member Hamidi? What what are your thoughts? Are you are you uh, are you agreeable, amenable to a uh, to a friendly amendment? Uh, oh yeah, friendly? absolutely. Okay. I just want to make sure make make clear that it, the number and severity of leaks clearly should have warranted a shutdown. So, yes. you know, if, if, if you know, staff wants to add more clarifying language, I'm certainly open to that. I, I would want to offer that uh, we would not support words that say prevent the explosion. 
understand there was significant gas in the ground that was still measured 12 days after the shutdown. Uh, the isolation of the pipeline implicit in that is the evacuation of the affected street. Well, are we are we talking about just merely inserting after the first two incidents, comma, prior to the explosion? Should have prompted Atmos Energy. I mean, that I, I think that's what we're getting at, is it not? I, that, that's that, what I'm that, hearing. That was my suggestion. Yes, it was, and I give you full credit for it. That, that, I think that could work for me if it works for Member Hominy. I mean, again, it's her motion, but uh, and so Rob, you're saying that uh, well, we can't say that there would not have been an explosion because there was still a lot of gas in the uh, in the soil, and so we can't say that it would have prevented the accident but, by the explosion, but it could have allowed them to take proper precautions, shut it off, and evacuate. Uh, the residents. Yes, sir. So, Go ahead, please, Member Hamidi. Identified prior to the explosion. Yes. I'm, I'm good with that. Good. I can read it if you want. Yes, if you don't mind, please. Okay, here's, here's an amended motion. I'm sorry, uh, Member Hamidi, but yeah, this will be her amended motion, and then we'll get a second on that if that works. Limitations of the equipment and procedures due to the wet weather conditions on the ability of Atmos Energy Corporation to reliably detect the presence of leaked gas during its response to the first two incidents and the number and severity of leaks identified prior to the explosion should have prompted Atmos Energy Corporation to shut down or isolate the pipeline. <laughs> Now that does change it just a little bit because now you've opened up a broader timeline, I believe, um, because what we're saying is that the, severe, the, the leaks were identified after the first two incidents. Do I understand correctly? So if you remove the first two incidents, uh, those leaks could have been identified two weeks prior. I think uh, uh, Member Chapman's solution is a little more precise. In other words, I believe Member Chapman's was inserted, his prior words prior to the explosion were inserted after the, the clause that says following the first two incidents. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that correct, Mr. Chapman, Member Chapman? Uh, yeah, trying to find the right button here. Yes, I would, I would say the, the first identified following the first two incidents and prior to the explosion. That's what I heard you say, sir. Uh, I don't think you need following the first two incidents, and I'll explain why. The report is very clear that all these leaks were identified after those first two incidents. And so when you look at the finding in context of the report, uh, we don't we don't need and 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 eliminating that part of the phrase would just make it a little simpler and a little more plain language. My viewpoint, though, is that the findings should stand on their own. Is that when somebody turns to the executive summary where the findings are or the back of the report, they should be able to read the findings and get a fairly good idea of what happened. And I think the point that the vice chairman made is that we are trying to say that it was after the two, um, after the two incidents, they should have, they being Atmos Energy, based on the number of gas leaks that they found and the severity, they should have shut it down. It wasn't three weeks before on on February the 10th, for example, it was on February the 22nd is when they should have done this, I believe. Is that correct, Member Hominy? Well, actually, I think there is a problem with even including following the first two incidents because, well, OK. All right, that's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, do we, so, would, so Member Hamadi, would your, would your f f amended motion be to add the word prior to the explosion after the clause that says following the first two incidents? Correct. 
Okay, would you kindly uh, reread the proposed amended finding, please? Limitations of the equipment and procedures due to the wet weather conditions on the ability of Atmos Energy Corporation to reliably detect the presence of leaked gas during its response to the first two incidents and the number and severity of leaks identified following the first two incidents and prior to the explosion should have prompted Atmos Energy Corporation to shut down or isolate the pipeline. Do we have a second for that? I'll second, although I'm just thinking here, we might want to be a little more precise about prior to the explosion, which explosion are we talking about? And maybe it would be appropriate to add the address. We could, we could do that. Thank you. There's been moved and seconded. Um, so now we're in the discussion phase and I will point out that the, the title of the report is in fact, um, I hear what you're saying, and, and that, that if, if that too. covers it, I'm I'm perfectly fine with it. Just, I was just looked at the title of the report last night, and uh, I would, yeah, it states the it is, Dallas, Texas explode uh, fire well, against fueled explosion uh, in the date. You're right. It's not doesn't say 34, 30, 35, 34 Espan Espanola. It's a good point. But, but it does it's state following the, the first two incidents and prior to the explosion. So there wasn't an explosion between the final final house and the two incidents. Okay. Um, I, I, point well taken. Um, what I'm going to do is propose that we vote on it and then if staff later decides for clarity purposes that we need to add the address, which I'm not opposed to at all, then staff could advise us and recirculate that uh, for a possible vote after the fact. I think all of us realize here today that the, that the fire, the explosion we're referring to is the one that was at 3534 Espanola, but, uh, but it, may, it may clarify it. Uh, um, in, in, as you said, but does that sound acceptable to uh, everyone involved that we go ahead and vote on it now and then if staff feels when in the, in the final putting together of the report that it needs clarification, they can do that subject to our circulation to the board members for clarification. Does that sound reasonable? Okay, anything else from the staff before we move to a vote? No, sir. Okay, any other discussion that's been moved and seconded? Uh, in, in, any other discussion on this particular one? I don't see any heads nodding, so uh, it's been moved and seconded. The, it's been, uh, Member Homedy has moved to amend finding 12 as she just read. Um, we'll proceed to a roll call vote. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Aye. Vice Chairman Landsberg votes aye. Member Homedy. Aye. Member Hominy votes aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Aye. Member Chapman votes aye. Chairman votes aye. The motion to amend finding 12 has been adopted unanimously. Member Hominy. Uh, yeah, I have one clarification question before I get to my next amendment on finding 13. May I ask a question? Absolutely. On finding 13, Mr. Hall, I just wanted to ask, it says, had Atmos Energy pressure tested the main and the alley behind the first two incidents homes on February 21st or 22nd, what's involved with pressure testing? And I mean, is it realistic that they would conduct pressure testing on February 21st? I can understand the 22nd. I'm just trying to understand that. Uh, and sort of, and what other options they might have had. So the likely test that would have been performed would be a pressure drop test. So they would need to isolate gas to the houses and then isolate the main and monitor their pressure and see what happens. Uh, and was that the only other option, likely option for February 21st? 
Well, one of the things when you look at the industry guidance for doing uh, wet weather leak detection, uh, they list four options. Uh, the three are detectors that are unreliable, and the fourth option is a pressure drop test. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, I'm good until amendment until uh, 21. Please proceed. Okay. My uh, right now finding 21 says the methodology employed in Atmos Energy Corporation's gas distribution integrity management program was generally consistent with industry guidance and pipeline and hazardous material safety administration expectations, but did not adequately consider threats that were degrading its pipeline system. The likelihood of failure associated with these threats or the potential consequences of such a failure. My amendment would read, would replace that and read, essentially strikes the first part of that. And so my amendment instead would read, Atmos Energy Corporation did not adequately consider or mitigate against threats that were degrading its pipeline system. The likelihood of failure associated with these threats or the potential consequences of such a failure. And member Hamadi, thank you. In the underlined version that I have, um, there is um, also more to that. Yeah, I strike that. Okay, so that's a, that's a strike that you're adding right now. Okay, that's a strike right now. Okay, all right. So the, so it begins with failure. The um, ends with failure. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. It begins with failure. Thank you. And that's true. Everything ends with failure. Okay. All right. Um, it's been moved. Is there a second for member Hamadi's motion? For the purposes of discussion, Mr. Chairman, I'll second. The vice chairman seconds and member Hamadi, you're recognized. Uh, thanks very much. Um, PHMSA regulations are pretty specific on what should be considered as part of an integrity management plan and integrity management program, including knowing your pipeline, identifying threats to your pipeline, which must consider uh, uh, the following categories, corrosion, natural forces, excavation damage, other outside force damage, material weld or joint failure, equipment failure, incorrect op operation, other concerns that could threaten the integrity of your pipeline. They also make very clear an operator must consider reasonably available information to identify existing and potential threats. Sources of data may include incident and leak history, corrosion control records, continuing surveillance, patrolling records, maintenance history, and excavation damage experience. There were a number of areas uh, where Atmos did not reach meet the expectations beyond just the requirements in the base rulemaking. There's a lot of information in the rulemaking documents themselves, which add guidance to that. Uh, which are re, uh, which um, are reiterated in communications between pipeline operators and FIMSA. Um, and I even while I believe that the industry guidance by the gas piping technology committee may be a little bit lighter than we would like, it does reiterate FIMSA's requirements. So I, I think saying it meets uh, their expectations and guidance is is not accurate. I think Atmos Energy had a flawed uh, in, uh, integrity management program, and I think we've demonstrated that here. Thank you very much. Uh, discussion amongst my colleagues. I support the amendment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, and. Um, Staff, uh, what are, what's the viewpoint of staff? Staff supports the amendment. Thank you. Is there any further discussion regarding this amendment? Okay, it's been moved and seconded um, that we amend finding 21 as presented by Member Homedy. For a roll call vote, Member or Vice Chairman Landsberg. I vote aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Homedy. Aye. Member Hominy votes aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The chairman votes aye. Finding 21 has been amended unanimously. Member Hominy. 
Uh, one minor amendment to finding 22. Uh, finding 22 currently states while Atmos Energy Corporation's periodic leak survey methodology and frequency complied with the minimum state and federal requirements, it was not able to identify the degraded system that was found after the explosion. I circulated an amendment which would have replaced was not able uh, with failed. So it would say it failed to identify the degraded system. Uh, I think staff would prefer that it say did not rather than failed and I'm okay with that. So if you would amend your amendment that I circulated uh, and I'll read my proposal now, which is while Atmos Energy Corporation's periodic leak survey methodology and frequency complied with the minimum state and federal requirements, it did not identify the degraded system that was found after the explosion. Okay, it's been moved by Member Homedy, and basically we are disregarding the um, copy that was sent last night and we're replacing it. It did not identify the degraded system. Is that correct, Member Homedy? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's been moved. Is it? Has it been seconded? Second. It's uh, been seconded by Member Chapman and Member Homedy. Yeah, uh, I just felt like it was not able to identify a degraded system. They could have identified it. And so I wanted to be more affirmative by saying did not identify. Thank you. Discussion from my colleagues. OK, seeing none, uh, Mr. Hall, what does staff think? Uh, we support uh, changing the words to did not. OK. Um, very good. And uh, any any further discussion? Okay, it's been moved and seconded to amend finding 22 to strike the words was not able and to replace with did not. Insert did not. And uh, it's been moved and seconded. There's no further discussion. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Homedy. Aye. Member Homedy votes aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The chairman votes aye. Finding 22 has been amended, uh, has, has been approved as amended. Are there any other amendments for the findings? Okay, seeing none, at this time, do I have a motion to adopt the findings as all 22 findings. We have a motion to adopt all 22 findings as we just amended. I believe we amended five of the findings. Do I have a motion for such? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Vice Chairman votes so uh, has, uh, has uh, moved. Is there a second? I second. Member Chapman seconds. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt the findings as amended. Vice Chairman Landsberg, what is your vote? Aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Homedy. Aye. Member Ch Homedy votes aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The Chairman votes aye. The findings have been adopted as amended. Ms. Bryson, if you'll please read the proposed probable cause. Yes, sir, staff proposes the following probable cause. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the explosion at 3534 Espinola Drive was excavation damage that went undetected as the steel degraded for at least 23 years, resulting in a natural gas leak that Atmos Energy Corporation failed to detect when responding to related incidents on the same block in the two days prior to the explosion. The excavation damage likely occurred during work by a third party in 1995. Contributing to the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporation's insufficient wet weather leak investigation procedures. Very good, thank you very much. I know that uh, 
Member Hamidi has proposed a um, an amendment to that. Do we have any other proposed amendments to the probable cause? What I'd like to ask is literally, uh, I just printed the latest version of this as we were starting. I'd like to give us all about two minutes just to read this before Member Hamidi makes a motion, if that's okay. We'll take just a couple minutes. I think the vice chairman's still reading, and uh, and if that's the case, are you still reading, sir? Um, as good as it's going to get. Okay, all right, thank you, Member Hamidi. I understand you have a uh, proposed amendment to the probable cause, and you're recognized. Yep, uh, the probable my amendment would read: the National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the explosion at 3534 Española Drive was the ignition of an accumulation of natural gas that leaked from the main damage during a sewer replacement project 23 er years earlier and was undetected by Atmos Energy Corporation's investigation of two natural gas incidents each of the two days prior to the explosion. Contributing to the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporation's insufficient wet weather leak investigation procedures and inaction to isolate the main and evacuate the houses prior to the fatal expo explosion. Contributing to the degradation of the pipeline system was Atmos Energy Corporation's inadequate integrity management program, which failed to consider or mitigate against existing and potential threats to its pipeline system. May I ask a question? Because the copy that I have, version three, I, and maybe you read this, did, did you read contributing to the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporate Atmos Energy Corporation's insufficient wet weather leak investigation procedures. Did you read that? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm a slow reader, and I was behind you there. So, uh, so it was read as uh, Eric sent out the revision. I guess exactly like that. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you. Um, is there? It's been it's been moved as read by Member Hamidi to amend the probable cause. Is there a second? Second. Member Graham seconds and discussion. Member Hamidi, I recognize you for discussion. Thank you very much. Um, the I, I did feel reading the probable first. I felt reading the probable cause could lead some readers to believe that the excavation damage, while while undetected, could have been leaking for 23 years. We don't know that. It could have started leaking in 2017 could have started leaking, you know, months prior. We just don't know. And so I thought it read a little bit misleading. And so I wanted to be very clear. And so what I did was look at what we've done in previous investigations where we had excavation damage and um, uh, gas migration as a result in the ignition of gas. So that explains the beginning um, portion of that. Uh, I kept the wet weather leak investigation procedures, I did add, had they isolated the main, 
and evacuated the houses prior to the prior to the explosion, there wouldn't have been an explosion. Uh, so I wanted to be clear on that. Uh, I also, uh, in my first version, had mentioned contributing to the explosion was at most energy corporations inadequate integrity management program, which I still believe was a factor and could have been a factor in the uh, in the explosion. I think there's some uh, discussion there, so I wanted to be make clear that it was contributing to the degradation of the pipeline system overall, uh, where we've already adopted a finding. Thank you. It's it's, uh, it's been moved and seconded by Member Graham, I believe it was. Um, is there discussion, questions from Member Hominy? Yes, sir, Vice Chairman. Um, I've got a question on the second sentence. So that reads, contributing to the explosion was Atlas Energies Corporation insufficient wet weather leak investigation procedures and an action to isolate the main. Um, could you explain how the evacuation of the houses would have had anything, any bearing on the, the subsequent explosion. I, it seems to me that we should maybe strike the words and evacuate the houses and just leave an inaction to isolate the main prior to the fatal explosion. I, I mean, I, I'm fine with that change. It, it, it just, it's a little more precise. And as I say, the evacuation is, that would certainly have lessened the injuries and prevented the fatality, but it, it doesn't contribute to the explosion. Yes, now further, may I jump in here? It did contribute to the severity of the explosion. And and I think that Member Hominy's point, I think we it would be good to get in there the words and the and in action to isolate the main and evacuate the houses. So, um, well, suppose you put in uh, contributing to the explosion and severity. So just right after the word explosion, put and severity, and then then it reads better. C comments on that, Member Hamidi. So it would read contributing to the explosion and. Severity was at most energy corporations insufficient wet weather leak investigations procedures and inaction to isolate the main. And evacuate the houses prior to the explosion because now you have addressed the severity aspect. Prior to that, you didn't. It was just the explosion. So, uh, except now you're modifying the portion on the wet weather leak investigation procedures. Well, the explosion theoretically wouldn't have happened had they done a good job of wet weather leak investigation. Or right. combining a couple of things. Now, maybe you could break that into two sentences and say, uh, in action to isolate the main uh, prior to the fatal explosion. Um, contributing to the severity of the explosion was the failure to evacuate the houses. I, I'm just saying we're kind of mixing a couple of things together here and it's it's wordsmithing in the extreme. I apologize. Vice Chairman, I think you have a very good point. No need to apologize. Mm -hmm. um, you know, oftentimes what we've done is we've talked about contributing, you know, the accident, the causal factors to the accident, and then and then at some point we may say contributing to the severity of the of the event. And and that's a standalone sentence. And I think that it's a very good point that you've raised and, and maybe we could um, maybe we could work through that, but I, I think um, maybe what we could do is, um, I, I suspect we're in fairly much agreement, um, I could be wrong, that conceptually this is a good way to go, both Member Hamidi's, um wording and the proposed, the thoughts that the Vice Chairman has. Maybe we could, um, we could have staff circulate that for changes uh, after the board meeting. 
instead of trying to craft it here on the dais, I find I've found that that when we do things on the on the dais here, there are issues. Um, staff or GC or managing director, any thoughts on that procedurally? What would be your recommendation at this point? Um, I, I don't oppose the idea as long as you you the board is all clear on what it is you're asking staff to contribute so that you're voting. You all know what you're voting on, basically. Yes, thank you. And I'm not sure I, I would want to make sure that we have agreement conceptually on that and we could vote conceptually on that and then and then further ratify the proposed change. Uh, but um, Managing Director Bryson, what are your thoughts on that? I'm going to defer to general counsel, but I I don't know that I have clarity myself right now what you're asking staff to do. So okay. perhaps All right. uh, we're happy to do whatever you need us to do. I just want yeah, to be you. clear what you're asking us to do. Yeah, thank you. Here's the issue. I think we, you know, it's it's 230 and uh, and we have a long way to go and and I don't want us to be in the in the heat of the battle or in the fatigue of the battle to make a drafting error so what I might propose is that we and procedurally I think I'd have to get member Hamandy to to agree to this and member Graham but that we conceptually agree that we would like to uh, uh, approve the probable cause as amended by um, member Hamadi, but have staff clarify as a contributing factor to the accident, contributing, contributing to the severity of the accident was Atmos Energy's um, failure in action to isolate the main and evacuate the houses prior to the fatal explosion. Uh, I think conceptually, uh, or we can work through it right now. We can we can spend 20 minutes uh, offline and come back with that. Uh, I just wanted to avoid that wearing down where we make a mistake by coming up with language that we're not happy with. Any thoughts on this from my colleagues? I'm OK with it. Mr. Chairman, I'm OK with that in, in, in concept. I, I wonder, though, if it isn't fairly easily addressed if we were to say I think this is along the lines of what the vice chairman proposed contributing to the explosion and the severity of the event was etc cetera, etc cetera. well that contributing to the explosion and the severity of the event the wet the 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 inadequate the insufficient wet weather leak procedure yeah did not contribute to the severity. So maybe maybe that could be contributing to the explosion was Atmos Energy's insufficient wet weather leak investigation procedure, period. And contributing in the new sentence, contributing to the severity of the event was Atmos Energy's in action to isolate the main and evacuate the houses prior to the fatal explosion. That clarifies it. Member Graham, and I know that Member Hamidi would like to say something yeah. as well. My, my concern with that is we're, we're, we're saying the severity only has to do with the in action to isolate the main. If we would have isolated the main, we would have found they would have found the leak and we wouldn't have had the explosion. I'm, hope, I'm hoping that's what would happen. So that I, I'm, I'm concerned with taking putting that in the severity column. Did, did yeah. you say that we, if they isolated the main, they would not have had the explosion? Is that what you said? I'm saying if they would have isolated the main, you would think they would have found the leak in the main, which hopefully then they would have repaired it and we never would have had the explosion. And but we, I guess we don't really know that because we had a service line leak too, but hopefully in isolating the main, they would have found that also. But I think what member, what mem Mr. Hall said in a previous discussion was there was enough gas in that soil that even nine days after they shut it off, they still found high levels of, uh, of, of uh, explosive level of, of, of gas. Is that correct, Mr. Hall? Yes, sir. Okay. 
if we put a period after main, so in action to isolate the main, and then, so period, and then say um, contributing to the severity was the failure to evacuate houses prior to the fatal explosion. Does that work? I don't think so. Uh, how about contributing to the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporation's insufficient wet weather leak investigation procedures. Contributing to the severity of the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporation's inaction to isolate the main and evacuate houses, period. I, I would certainly support that. I think that captures it. I'd like to see what staff's response is to that. Absolutely. We, we will always ask for staff's response. And if I forget, I want you to uh, to ding me on that. And I know that I'm getting tired and I suspect you all are too. So uh, I'm, I'm likely to make, make mistakes. And so, actually, may I hop into, could you just read it one more time? Because I, I think I have enough changes to those words. I'm not sure exactly where the periods and sentences yeah. beginning at, and end. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the And I'm actually make sh I'm going to add one word back in, so I'm going to read it. Uh, the National Transportation Safety Board determines the probable cause of the explosion at 3534 Espanola Drive was the ignition of an accumulation of natural gas that leaked from the main, damaged during a sewer replacement project 23 years earlier, and was undetected by Atmos Energy Corporation's investigation of two related natural gas incidents each of the two days prior to the explosion. Contributing to the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporation's insufficient wet weather leak investigation procedures. Contributing to the severity of the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporation's inaction to isolate the main and evacuate the houses. So that addresses the residual gas issue. I still have a line on integrity management, but that's a discussion I, I want to have on, with staff that we should have. But so, Member Hamadi, did I hear you that that at this point in what you just read, you're not going forward with the with the clause that says contributing to the degradation um, was the Atmos Energy's inadequate. Uh, integrity management system. Is I, that I, I wanted to have a discussion on that with staff. Okay. Um, well, would you like to go ahead and vote on that part of it and just get that part done? Because I'm, I, I'm afraid this is going to uh, unravel here. Do you want to vote on the first half of it? And then how, how would you like to do that? I, so, I'd, like to have, I'd like to have, I'd like, huh? Chairman Simwalt, can we break for five minutes and allow staff to have a discussion and bring back to you uh, what we agree with? Yes, I, I would certainly entertain that. And um, absolutely. So we are going to go into recess. We're going to give you nine minutes. We're going to go into recess until two. 45. So we're in recess for that. Mics and cameras off, please.
Okay, we are back in session now. So we've got a motion on the table. It's been seconded. However, staff has uh, uh, been working on proposed language. And um, with the concurrence of my colleagues, I'd like to hear what uh, what the staff is proposing. OK, the staff has has gone through the entire PC. We also looked at the integrity management section, so uh, I'll read. It's very similar to what the last item was. Uh, the National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the explosion at 3534 Española Drive was the ignition of an accumulation of natural gas that leaked from the main damaged <coughs> during a sewer replacement project 23 years earlier and was undetected by Atmos Energy Corporation's investigation of two related natural gas incidents each of the two days prior to the explosion. <coughs> So that would be the first sentence. The second sentence, contributing to the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporation's insufficient wet weather leak investigation procedures, period. Then, contributing to the severity of the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporation's inaction to isolate the affected main and evacuate the houses, period. And I'll read what we would agree, what we came up with for the final sentence. Uh, contributing to the degradation of the pipeline system was Atmos Energy Corporation's inadequate integrity management program, period. We deleted the proposed words, which failed to consider or mitigate against existing and potential threats to its pipeline system. They did consider some threats and mitigate some threats, but we're saying not all. So we just want to terminate it and say it was inadequate. That That is what staff would propose. OK, um, Member Homedy, um, you have a motion on the table. Would you be willing to accept that as a, I'll call it a friendly amendment or a substitute motion? Would you be willing to, um, does that, what are your thoughts on that? I think those are very good changes. And I want to thank, thank staff for uh, a good response. So, uh, yes, I would be willing to uh, replace my amendment with that. Or if Kathy prefers, I can withdraw my amendment. However, well, 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 that's probably the right way to do it, don't you think, okay, uh, Kathy? Is to have it uh, withdrawn first. Is that is that it's what you said? It's probably easiest just because we have made so many changes yes. and suggestions. So it's probably best to start fresh. Right. Yep, I withdraw my amendment. And, and general counsel, in a situation like that, I always call for the person who uh, who seconded it. Is that necessary? Uh, it, it's a it's a nice thing to do because, of course, they they concurred with the motion in the first yeah. place. It's not absolutely necessary, yeah, but it's thanks. always good to have that on the record as well. Thank thank you very much. I believe uh, Member Graham, you were the one who um, who concur who uh, seconded it. Would you uh, also agree to uh, Member Hominy's uh, withdrawing the motion? I agree uh, with withdrawing. Thank you very much. Member Hominy, you are recognized to make a motion. Hopefully I get this right. Would you like, <laughs> would you, what? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Would you like for Member Graham to, I'm sorry for Member Hall to read it and then let you say <laughs> that's your, your motion? Yes, go for it, Member Hall. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I'm not a member, but uh, I will read the proposal. It's getting late in the day, but go for it. Yeah. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the explosion at 3534 Española Drive was the ignition of an accumulation of natural gas that leaked from the main, damaged during a sewer replacement project 23 years earlier and was undetected by Atmos Energy Corporation's investigation of two related natural gas incidents each of two days prior to the explosion. 
Contributing to the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporation's insufficient wet weather leak investigation procedures. Contributing to the severity of the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporation's inaction to isolate the affected main and evacuate the houses, period. Contributing to the degradation of the pipeline system was Atmos Energy Corporation's inadequate integrity management program. Okay, uh, Member Hamadi, is that your motion? Yes. Uh, is there a second? Second. Member Graham has seconded. So for discussion, I have a uh, discussion point. So. So in your motion, we have struck uh, at the part where we get into the contributing to the severity of, we say is the, uh, I think we said is the uh, Atmos Energy Corporation's inaction to isolate the main and evacuate the houses, period. We don't put prior to the explosion. Is that correct? That's the way I heard it read. Yes, yeah, staff struck prior to the explosion. We think it's understood because you're not going to do something after the explosion that changes its severity. Yeah. Uh, but we did say affected Maine, and you did not repeat that word. Uh, 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 isolate the affected Maine and, uh, and evacuate the houses, period. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. I have two other points. This might sound editorial, but uh, but it, but it's bugging me right now. In the first sentence, we say um, the ignition of an accumulation of natural gas that leaked from the main damaged. It almost sounds like a perhaps a fragmented sentence. So I'm wondering if if we could say that leaked from the gas main that was damaged during the sewer replacement project. Would you be willing to accept those words? Right now it reads the, the main damaged. That's a bit more, uh, it's clearer, more elegant, sir. Member Hamandy, it's your motion. I just was reading it. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, thank you. So it's. Okay. So it reads the National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the explosion at 3534 Española Drive was the ignition of an accumulation of natural gas that leaked from the gas main that was damaged during a sewer replacement project. Uh, on and on. Yeah, yes, that's that's correct. That that's what I would like to see there, Vice Chairman. At, at the risk of bringing this up and I apologize again, um uh, later on in that sentence, it says, uh, some, uh, uh, Director Hall, something about two natural gas incidents on each of the two days prior. Does that mean there were a total of four incidents, two on one day and two on the next? That's not what we intend. I, I understand that, but um, again, I apologize for, for bringing it up, but it it's... Could you read the sentence again and then see if anybody else is? Well, I, I, I do see your point, sir. And I think if we delete the the word, the first word too, so I'll, it would say uh, was undetected by Atmos Energy Corporation's investigation of related natural gas incidents each of the two days prior to the explosion. That would be much better. On the other hand, we want to specify that it was, in fact, two related natural gas incidents. And I would just scratch on 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 the two days prior to the explosion because we want to be specific so of each of. Correct. Got it. That that's that's even better. It was two. We want to be sure that we're enunciating or enumerating that it was two related natural gas instance two days prior to the explosion. Member Hamadi, this is your motion. We're uh, kind of picking it apart, but uh, what are your thoughts? I'd like a minute for us to read it. Okay, sure, absolutely.
And it would be on the two days prior to the explosion. With the insert of related, which I think we already have. It would be two related natural gas incidents on the two days prior to the explosion. Okay, I'm good with that. Yes. Okay, I think I've added a few things. The vice chairman's added a few things. What I think we should do is, first of all, we've got it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion on this probable cause, including from staff, what we're going to do is restate the motion one last time because we've added a little bit here and a little bit there. Let's let's restate it. It's been moved and seconded, and then we'll vote on it. Um, member Hamidi, you may, or we can get member um, member uh, get uh, Mr. Hall. Yeah, sorry for the pay cut. Okay, I'm going to try to do this. Okay. <laughs> the National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the explosion at 3534 Espanola Drive was the ignition of an accumulation of natural gas that leaked from the gas main that was damaged during a sewer replacement project 23 years earlier and was undetected by Atmos Energy Corporation's investigation of two related natural gas incidents on the two days prior to the explosion, period. Am I good so far? Contributing to the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporation's insufficient wet weather leak investigation procedures, period. Contributing to the severity of the explosion was Atmos Energy Corporation's inaction to isolate the affected main and evacuate the houses, period. Contributing to the degradation of the pipeline system was Atmos Energy Corporation's inadequate integrity management program. Second. That, that's been moved and seconded. As I understand it, there's no further discussion. You all have moved around on my screen, so it's going to mess up how I do the roll call. So we'll now proceed to the roll call. Um, let me see if I can move you. No? Okay. I'm going to uh, hang on just a second. Let me if I can get you in the right order. Well, whatever. Okay. So, um, Vice Chairman, what is your vote? I vote aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Homedy. Aye. Member Homedy votes aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The Chairman votes aye. The probable cause has been adopted unanimously. So thank you. I think that I believe it's 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 better now uh, due to the contributions of ev of everyone. So thank you. So um, general counsel, as you know, we just voted for it in, in, in its entirety. And so I don't believe we need uh, any sort of additional vote on that. Do you agree with that? I agree. OK, thank you. Um, Miss uh, Miss Bryson, if you'd please read the proposed recommendations. Yes, sir. As a result of this of its investigation, the National Transportation Safety Board makes the following 14 new safety recommendations. In addition, we're re reiterating three recommendations. Um, there are three to the pipeline hazardous materials safety administration. Number one, expand incident reporting requirements in Title 49, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 191, so that events that may meet the definition of incident are immediately reported to the National Response Center, even when the source of the natural gas has not been determined. Number two, evaluate industry's implementation of the gas distribution pipeline integrity management requirements and develop updated guidance for improving their effectiveness. The evaluation should specifically consider factors that may increase the likelihood of failure, such as age, increase the overall risk, paren, including factors that simultaneously increase the likelihood and consequence of failures, and limit the effectiveness of leak management programs. The third recommendation to FIMSA is actually a companion recommendation to one that we're making to the Railroad Commission of Texas, so it, re it reads a little awkward. 
Um, but the third is assist the Railroad Commission of Texas in conducting the audit recommended in safety recommendation P21XX, which is actually recommendation number four, which I'll be reading now. Uh, we have one recommendation to the Railroad Commission of Texas with assistance from the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration conduct a comprehensive audit of Atmos Energy Corporation's incident reporting practices, policies and procedures for responding to leaks, fires, explosions, and emergency calls and integrity management programs. To the Dallas, th there are three to the Dallas Fire Rescue Department. Number five, revise the continuing education requirement for your arson investigators to include training on building fuel gas on building fuel gas systems. Number six, revise your procedures to require gas monitoring after the occurrence of a gas related structure fire or explosion. Number seven, develop and implement a formal process to alert appropriate local, state and federal agencies of potential systemic safety issues that should be investigated further. There are five recommendations to um, the Atmos Energy Corporation. Provide initial and recurrent training to the Dallas Fire Rescue Department arson investigators and firefighters on the local natural gas distribution system and associated hazards. Recommendation number nine, develop and implement more rigorous inside leak investigation requirements in response to fires and explosions when gas involvement cannot be excluded, including clear guidance on pressure testing and inside gas measurements and the potential need to return to the property after firefighters have departed. Number 10, develop a clear procedure to coordinate with local emergency responders when investigating all fires and explosions that may be gas related to conclusively determine whether your system can be excluded as a potential contributor and collecting the necessary evidence to support the conclusion of your investigations. Number 11, revise your policies and procedures for responding to leaks, fires, explosions and emergency calls to address the challenges caused by wet weather conditions. The revised policies and procedures should include one, leak investigation methods that are reliable in wet weather. Number two, or two, leak investigation procedures that assess all viable gas migration paths. Three, criteria for when to shut down or isolate gas distribution systems and pressure test main and service lines. And four, an alternate safe response such as evacuation when reliable leak investigations are not possible due to wet weather. Recommendation 12, assess your integrity management program, paying particular attention to the areas identified in this investigation and revise the program to appropriately consider one, threats that degrade a system over time and two, the increased risk that can result from factors that simultaneously increase the likelihood and consequence of failure. There are two recommendations to the American Gas Association Gas Piping Technology Committee. Recommendation 13, develop additional guidance that identifies steps gas distribution operators can take to safely respond to leaks, fires, explosions, and emergency calls, considering the limitations due to wet weather conditions that includes one, criteria for when to shut down or isolate gas distribution systems, pressure test main and service lines, and begin evacuations. Number two, leak investigation methods that are reliable in wet weather. Three, require an alternate safe response, such as an evacuation, when reliable leak investigations are not possible due to wet weather and four, leak investigations that assess all viable gas migration paths, including granular backfill and crawl spaces. Uh, number 14, develop guidance that identifies steps that gas distribution operators can take to ensure that their gas distribution integrity management program at a minimum 
appropriately considers one, threats that degrade a system over time, and two, the increased risk that can result from factors that simultaneously increase the likelihood and consequence of failure. <clears throat> we have three previously issued recommendations reiterated in this report. There's one to the International Code Council. <clears throat> it is P19006 in coordination with the Gas Technology Institute and the National Fire Protection Association incorporate provisions in the International Fuel Gas Code that requires methane detection systems for all types of residential occupancies with gas service. <clears throat> At a minimum, the provision should cover the installation, maintenance, placement of the detectors, and testing requirements. This recommendation is currently classified open acceptable response. There's one to the National Fire Protection Association. It is P19007. In coordination with gas technology, with the Gas Technology Institute and the International Code Council, revise the National Fuel Gas Code, National Fire Protection Association 54, to require methane detection systems for all types of residential occupancies with gas service. At a minimum, the provision should cover the installation, maintenance, placement of detectors, and testing requirements. This recommendation is currently classified open, acceptable, alternate response. There's one to the Gas Technology Institute, which is P19008. In accordance with the National Fire Protection Association and the International Code Council, work to develop standards for methane detection systems for all types of residential occupancies in both the International Fuel Gas Code and the National Fuel Gas Code, National Fire Protection Association 5.4. At a minimum, the provision should cover the installation, maintenance, placement of detectors, and testing requirements. This recommendation is currently classified open, acceptable response. And that concludes the recommendations. Ms. Bryson, thank you very much for reading those. And um, I believe we have uh, some amendments on the desk uh, by Member Hamidi. Are there any other amendments uh, proposed before we move to Member Hamidi? Okay, uh, Member Hamidi, you're recognized. Uh, well, actually, I'd like to ask questions. I, I had proposed striking the first recommendation on incident reporting on events that may meet the definition of incident. Um, and I'd like to ask staff some questions about that first. And the reason, you know, the reason why FIMSA just completed a rulemaking on incident reporting um, that we weighed in on, this was not one of the issues, but um, following the Marshall, Michigan uh, rupture and Staff, when I questioned this provision to make sure that it would make a difference because we issue recommendations uh, that would prevent a similar uh, uh, in incident or group of incidents from occurring again, uh, I was pointed to the Minnesota Office of Pipeline Safety, which provided some guidance for what would be considered a significant event. And I was also pointed to industry uh, guidance, but both of those link to a, a, a release occurring, a release causing any of the following evacuations of 10 or more, evacuation of a school, rerouting of traffic, 50 or more customers out of service, any media attention, unintentional fire explosion. I still wonder what they envision with this one because there wasn't recognition of a release the first, I, there should have been the second day, but the first day. So I just would like to understand a little bit more from, from staff on what they would envision with this recommendation. I would like to ask Sarah to answer that, but I do wanna make a point before uh, she answers. If we think back to Merrimack Valley, which was a huge accident, a very significant event, there was no release in Merrimack Valley. 
by the way that, that FEMSA talks about it. So I just want to throw that out there for consideration. But Sarah, you want to weigh in? Sure. Um, so we did think a little bit about um, the burden that this might um, cause. And I, I actually think after this recommendation is issued, I mean, as they would have to anyway, going through the rulemaking process, FEMSA would have some additions that might help to narrow it a little bit if that's necessary. But one of the things that, that we did was reach out to, like, like you mentioned, Minnesota, um, to see what their expectation is with their um, operators. Because I, I just wanted to know if any other state is doing something like this. It seems like a problem that didn't first appear in the, the Dallas accident. And I thought probably folks that had been doing this for a while would have already worked to reconcile it. Um, so there it sounded like they had an understanding that their operators would report potential um, fire and explosion events and events that met certain criteria if they don't have um, solid evidence to exclude their system's involvement. So there might be a structure, and this is based on conversation, not you know, le legally binding, I suppose, but um, if their operator gets to a site and maybe there's a fire that is clearly associated with, you know, arson or something, then they would, it might have damaged the main and there was a release or whatever. If it didn't meet the criteria, they can exclude it. If there's a reason, so they would collaborate and um, come up with something where the op operator can definitively say it's not related and they can do that quickly, then they might not report it. But if they um, do have a gas related incident where it's questionable, they would call the regulator, then the regulator would work with them, the gas company and their emergency responders. So it shouldn't be, you know, every NRC, you know, it shouldn't be every structure fire explosion, every potential incident, we, we would envision it being gas related incidents. And there might be more criteria that FEMSA would be able to establish for what, you know, would clearly not meet the definition of an incident. Like what information would you have to say it clearly didn't meet the definition of incident. And then that could help to narrow the um, pool of potential reports. Uh, OK, I think that helps. And uh, what but just for clarification, Mr. Hall, what was did, didn't they report Merrimack? Yes, Massachusetts oh. reported Merrimack. I just wanted Under to point out. That, was it a significant event? That's yeah, how as a significant yeah as a significant event. I just wanted to point out that you don't have to have a release to have a significant event and report. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, where I confused it was the guidance in Minnesota's Office of Pipeline Safety that I was uh, referred to, which does say you have to have a release for all these other other categories. I saw Bruce's hands up, so I'll stop. May I uh, show my extreme ignorance here? Um, under the present uh, guidance, what happened uh, on, um, on in Dallas, the first two houses, would they not have met the criteria uh, for uh, reporting? I mean, it seems to me kind of strange that if you have a house blow up, uh, that it wouldn't meet some kind of criteria that at least people would assess it. And it seems like there was some delay in, in that. So isn't that what we're trying to get at here? It, it, I would say that the reason why they didn't report is because they considered it not a gas leak. And certain, and then therefore didn't consider it a significant event. There's there's several categories, but yeah, they Somehow, didn't. It seems like if a house blows up and and gas is involved, we should at least have people aware of what's going on. And so I'm, I'm just curious as to whether the guidance is sufficiently clear in that regard uh, to to warrant keeping this uh, as opposed to excluding it completely. I mean, I'm satisfied with how Ms. Lyons and Mr. Hall uh, responded. I was a little bit concerned based on previous discussions, but 
I mean, I'm okay with recommendation one as is. I do think in general there's not enough reporting. Uh, I just think when when I would encourage when safety recommendations sends over if we adopt this, that when safety recommendations sends over the recommendation, I think there probably should be some um, some discussion of of background uh, on the issue and what we expect uh, FIMSA to do in a that greater, way. A greater degree of specificity. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for that discussion. And so, um, as I understand it, uh, Member Hamidi, you might have uh, uh, one more. So you're not proposing a, an amendment to safety recommendation number one, I believe, but I no. believe you, you may have one for recommendation number 12. Yeah, and it's very small. Uh, recommendation 12 tells Atmos Energy to assess and revise their integrity management program. Uh, my amendment would add the words without delay right before and wouldn't change the rest of the uh, recommendation. And the reason I do that, well, first, that's my amendment. Okay, uh, it's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been uh, moved by Member Homedy, seconded by the Vice Chairman. Member Homedy, back to you. Yeah, the reason I do that is because I, I didn't want a situation where Atmos Energy waits for the Railroad Commission of Texas and uh, in in with the assistance of FIMSA to conduct a comprehensive audit of Atmos's integrity management programs to uh, conduct their assessment and revise it. They should do that immediately to ensure uh, public safety. Thank you. Comments on that? Uh, Member Graham. Oops, you've got the same problem I've had. Yeah. Sorry about that. It's easy to uh, do. Yeah, uh, I would support the amendment uh, without delay. Uh, I agree with it and I would hope after three years they're uh, have already in the process or already doing this after everything that's happened. Very good, thank you. Um, Further comments or discussion? Then uh, to Mr. Hall, what does staff say on this? Uh, staff supports the amendment. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any further discussion? It's been moved and seconded to add the words uh, without delay to, uh, to the beginning of recommendation 12. It's been moved and seconded. There's no further discussion. Vice Chairman, what is your vote, please? Aye. Aye, Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Homedy. Aye. Member Homedy votes aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Aye. Member Chapman votes aye. Chairman votes aye. Um, recommendation number 12 has been amended, uh, has been adopted unanimously. The amendment to recommendation 12 has been adopted unanimously. Uh, are there any other recommendations, uh, amendments to any other recommendations? Okay, now we need to go back and uh, I'll entertain a motion to go back and, and adopt all of the recommendations as we just amended for recommendation 12. Is there a motion for such? So moved. Mm -hmm. uh, that was member Chapman that moved and is there a second? Vice Chairman seconded, it's been moved and seconded to adopt the recommendations as amended. Any discussion? Seeing none, Vice Chairman, your vote please. All right. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Homedy. Aye. Member Homedy votes aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The Chairman votes aye. The recommendations have been adopted unanimously as amended. So um, at this point, uh, we will move to the adoption of the final report. But as I understand it, uh, Member Homedy has uh, uh, an amendment or so for uh, the report language. I, I, believe think I, can, I think I can withdraw. Well, I'm not going to offer my amendments. Uh, I believe on, I would just direct staff to uh, page 78. I believe the phrase that is contained uh, lines three through five were just inserted in the wrong place. And I think they actually belong later in the paragraph. So I believe that could just be an editorial change on their part. 
Okay. Um, any questions about that staff? Um, Sarah, anybody? Um, I, um, we, we'd be fine with making that editorial. I will point out that there there is another editorial required in that statement. It says arson technician and it right. should say atmos technician. It, exactly. Yeah. I thought the report had it right, but uh, but um, but it was. What line is that on, Rob? Well, in, in the, lines in the, three through five. Yeah, that would be on line three where it says because the arson technician and it should say Atmos technician. Yeah, I saw that on member Hamidi's proposed amendment, but I did not see that in the in the uh, in the, in the in the main body of the report. But uh, in any event, uh, as it relates to the editorial suggestion that member Hamidi suggested, I certainly have no problem with that. Does, does anyone else have any objection to that? No. Okay, I think it is editorial in nature. Um, general counsel, thoughts on that? I I agree. I believe that's the best way to handle that. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, does um, anyone have any additional issues related to the report that they wish to discuss? And before I move on, uh, Member Hominy, I believe uh, I believe you're good. No no motions as it relates to the uh, to the final report itself. Okay. Well, uh, is there a motion to adopt the report as revised? So moved. The vice chairman has moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. Member Hominy uh, seconded. And uh, the, it's been moved and seconded. We'll conduct a roll call vote. Uh, we're adopting the report uh, as amended. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Homedy. Aye. Member Homedy votes aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The Chairman votes aye. The report, the final report, has been adopted as amended. Um, do any of my colleagues wish to reserve the right to file a concurring or dissenting statement? I'd like to reserve the right. Member Hamidi reserves the right. Any others? Okay. Well, as we prepare to wrap it up, uh, the board members and staff, if you like, are welcome to turn off your, uh, your cameras and mic. In closing, uh, I want to thank my colleagues on the board for their preparation going into the board meeting and for, for the very good discussion and debate. Uh, special thanks to the entire staff, investigative staff from the Office of Rail, Railroad, Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Investigations and the Office of Research, of Research and Engineering. I always say, though, that nothing happens at this agency through just one person or one department. It's truly a group effort, and so therefore a sincere thanks not only to just the, uh, not only to those who, who worked on the report, but to the program and the support staff as well who made it all possible, including the webcast. A lot of work goes into that. The recommendations that we issued and reiterated today instill, distill actionable knowledge from this pipeline accident and similar accidents in the past. If enacted, these recommendations would result in federal improvements, including a FEMSA evaluation of industry implement implementation of gas distribution integrity management requirements and expanded incident reporting requirements. They would result in the Railroad Commission of Texas audit of Atmos's incident reporting practices, emergency response procedures, and integrity management programs with the assistance of FEMSA. At Dallas Fire Rescue, today's recommendations would result in better awareness by arson investigators of building fuel gas systems, gas monitoring after gas-related fires or explosions, and a formal alerting process to communicate potential systemic safety issues to state, local, and federal authorities. At Atmos, they would strengthen training and investigation requirements as well as wet weather policies and procedures, coordination with local emergency responders and Atmos's integrity management program. They would also result in additional guidance from the, the American Gas Association. And finally, 
the recommendations that we issued and reiterated today would result in action on previous recommendations in favor of methane detectors, which mine should be arriving in a few hours. It's been said that although action without knowledge is insanity, knowledge without action is just daydreaming. And I hope that the knowledge gained in this investigation will result in action. We stand adjourned.